to ensure full service shelters in all five boroughs by 2024. And there is great news on that front. DOHMH is now moving to open a new shelter in Ridgewood, Queens. We, of course, want to continue to push the live release rate even higher, and we'll be considering a number of bills today which seek to achieve this goal. I am pleased to be the lead sponsor of one of those bills, Introduction 1570, which would require that owners of dogs being accepted at a boarding kettle, business, or similar establishment show proof of active immunization against Bordetella bacterium, also known as kennel cough, in the hopes that such vaccination will, require, will, will, will bring about further reduction in the instances of shelter euthanasia of dogs. Today's package of pill, bills introduces a variety of new protections for our four-legged and winged friends, including the creation of a City Department of Animal Welfare, a bill sponsored by Councilmember Brennan, a ban on the sale of foie gras that is made from force-fed birds, a bill sponsored by Councilmember Rivera, increased penalties for trafficking of wild birds, also sponsored by Councilmember Rivera, increased Penalties for animal abuse, a bill sponsored by Councilmember Joni. A consideration of heat indexes for horse carriages, a bill sponsored by Councilmember Powers. A ban on non-therapeutic cat declawing, a bill sponsored by Councilmember Brennan. And regulation for animals left behind after an eviction, also a bill sponsored by Councilmember Brennan. We will also hear bills today requiring further reporting from city agencies and affiliated entities, including a bill requiring DOHMH posting of more information connected to shelter euthanasia, sponsored by Councilmember Holden, a bill requiring New York City shelters posting of photographs of adoptable animals, also sponsored by Councilmember Brennan, a bill requiring the New York City Police Department to report on complaints of animal cruelty, sponsored by Councilmember Cabrera, and DOHMH, a bill requiring DOHMH to conduct an educational campaign regarding the proper disposal of deceased animals, sponsored by Councilmember Holden. Finally, we are hearing four resolutions, including a resolution to recognize Meatless Mondays in New York City, sponsored by Councilmember Rosenthal, a resolution calling on the state to prevent pet stores from offering dogs, cats, or rabbits for sale, sponsored by Councilmember Brennan. A resolution calling on the state to provide a tax credit for the adoption of household pets, sponsored by Councilmember Combo. And a resolution calling on the federal government to pass the so-called PACT Act, making animal abuse illegally federally, sponsored by Councilmember Holden. I look forward to a robust discussion on these bills and especially look forward to hearing from members of the public and to what I expect will be a passionate and respectful dialogue. We expect a very large number of people speaking today, and that's a great thing. We, how, however, are under a time constraint. Uh, we have an unexpected meeting of the entire City Council called for later today. Uh, a so-called stated meeting to pass time-sensitive bills related to sending um, uh, budget messages to Albany before their session uh, concludes later today. Um, we are going to do everything our, in our power to make sure everyone is heard. Uh, you have my commitment on that. But I am also going to try and keep the discussion moving. We will be adhering to strict time limits. The goal again today is for all voices on all sides of all these debates to be heard. I want to acknowledge we've now been joined by Councilmember Rivera, and I'm going to turn it over to the administration to kick us off. I will ask Committee Council Sara Liss to please administer the affirmation. Thank you, and this is for anyone who will be testifying or answering questions. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Yes. Please, Commissioner. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Levine, the Committee on Health, and council members. 
My name is Christine Kim, and I'm a senior community liaison at the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, and I work primarily on animal welfare issues. I am joined on the panel today by two colleagues, Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Division of Environmental Health, and Risa Weinstock, Chief Executive Officer of Animal Care Centers of New York City. Deputy Commissioner Schiff and I are pleased to represent Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration and to discuss the animal welfare package which is being considered today. The mayor has long supported progressive animal welfare legislation, signed many bills into law to protect animals, and implemented bold and positive policies for animals ranging from companion animals to wildlife. For example, in March of this year, the mayor announced that all New York City public schools will participate in Meatless Mondays affecting 1.1 million students. Not only will our schools, as well as all 11 of our public hospitals, be serving vegetarian meals on Mondays, but all city agencies will be required to phase out processed meat and reduce their beef purchases by 50% as directed by the mayor's Green New Deal to combat climate change. The mayor is also demonstrating the feasibility and success of large-scale non-lethal wildlife management with the implementation of the city's deer impact management plan, which has already led to a deer population reduction of approximately 15% and an estimated decrease of 77% in new births. This is a dramatic example of a humane and scientifically cutting edge alternative to hunting and conventional lethal methods of wildlife management. Through the city's Wildlife NYC campaign, we are promoting the safe coexistence of wildlife and people and managing other impacts of deer in our urban environment. Other accomplishments for wildlife include the mayor's support for the 2017 bill to ban wild and exotic animals from circuses in the city, and the addition of a wild bird rehabilitation center to our Bronx animal shelter projected to open in 2024. The Bronx shelter is just one of five major capital projects currently underway for animal care centers of New York City, our open admission municipal animal shelter system. In collaboration with City Council, the mayor has invested an unprecedented amount of capital funding into animal care centers, which will bring full service animal shelters to each of our five boroughs for the first time, as well as a standalone adoption center next to our Manhattan shelter. And this will further increase our ability to adopt out animals, enable New Yorkers to keep their pets rather than surrender them because of hardship, and provide critical animal services to our communities. With the support of the City Council, we are now well underway, and we have identified and are moving forward with sites for care centers in the Bronx and Queens. We also have capital projects in Staten Island and Brooklyn to fully renovate those shelters from the ground up. Each of these projects is designed by animal shelter experts with the health, safety, and well-being of animals in mind. Animal care centers is also changing people's understanding of what an open admission shelter can and should be. They are at a historic 94% placement rate of the approximately 30,000 animals they take in each year, making animal care centers a national leader in the placement of dogs and cats. Animal care center services are not contained to the physical structure of a shelter. They push their programs out into communities where low or no cost services can mean the difference between animal surrender or keeping pets in their homes. Shelter surrender rates are linked to zip codes and income, and the more we can promote access to care, the more likely we are to see human-animal families staying together. Animal Care Centers is providing exactly this kind of progressive programming, offering low and no-cost vaccine clinics, a food bank, and free training seminars in the Bronx, as well as spay and neuter services in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. They are a model for municipal sheltering in a large urban environment. Consequently, some of the country's most reputable animal welfare foundations, like Maddie's Fund and PetSmart Charities, seek out partnerships with animal care centers to pilot, pilot innovative programs to keep families and their pets together and out of shelters altogether. This commitment to shelter animals has been cemented in the past year when we signed a 34-year contract to ensure the stability animal care centers needs in order to continue delivering positive outcomes for shelter animals for decades to come. Once these capital projects are complete, New York City will have a totally revamped world-class shelter system that will be able to provide care for animals for generations of New Yorkers. In regards to intro 1478, the, the establishment of a Department of Animal Welfare, the administration recognizes the growth and success animal care centers has achieved 
with the support and oversight of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. For these reasons, it would be in the best interest of this city's shelter animals to keep animal care centers housed in its existing department. To create an entirely new Department of Animal Welfare with a sole function of overseeing the city's animal shelter provider and regulating the few private shelters would replicate a system that already exists and can lead to additional costs and inefficiencies. Much of the progress the city has made for shelter animals over the, over the years would be disrupted. There is tremendous value in the animal welfare liaison role at the mayor's office. It creates a direct link between the animal welfare community and City Hall, and it also allows me to coordinate interagency collaboration for animal welfare initiatives and projects for my seat at the mayor's office. I have the advantage of helping projects navigate between agencies, and, able, and I am able to encourage collaboration with the directive of the mayor. Next is intro 1496, ensuring the retrieval of companion animals by an animal shelter after an eviction or legal possession. We thank the council for raising the issue of animals who are abandoned or for other reasons left in homes during the eviction process. The administration agrees that it is an issue that needs to be addressed. These cases are complicated and deeply personal, and we want to make sure we take a very deliberate, constructive, and effective approach that does not place an undue burden on animal care centers. Companion animals are a part of human animal family units. Thus, human services and animal services must work collaboratively and share the responsibility of ensuring people and animals stay together. We look forward to continuing this discussion with council to ensure all appropriate parties have a protocol for the timely retrieval of animals after an eviction. Regarding intro 1498, requiring the NYPD to report data regarding animal cruelty complaints, the administration and New York City Police Department support increasing transparency and the intent of this bill. The NYPD is looking forward to working with the council on a reporting bill that provides meaningful data and that accurately reflects the realities of animal cruelty investigations. For instance, it is common for animal cruelty investigations to take more than 30 days since the cases depend on the outcome of a forensic examination and report completed by a forensic veterinarian. An animal that may appear emaciated will be removed for examination and observation, at which point a determination can be made about whether it was neglected by its owner or whether the condition is a result of an underlying illness, such as cancer. The time of an investigation is therefore subject to the time of the examination and observation period. The administration also supports the intent of intro 1378, banning the sales of certain poultry products that are the result of force feeding birds. The mayor believes in the humane treatment of animals and birds suffer, suffer tremendously in the production of foie gras. This cruelty and the resulting luxury product consumed by few New York Yorkers is completely unnecessary. However, we have heard the concerns of the producers outside the five boroughs regarding economic impact and job loss, and we encourage these producers to continue conversations with city council. The mayor has also always been clear about his position on horse-drawn carriages. The administration supports additional measures to protect carriage horses. We look forward to working with the council on intro 1425, which would add a heat index threshold to suspend horse carriage activity. Now I turn to my colleague, Corinne Schiff, who will further discuss the administration's feedback on the proposed bills. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Levine and council members. My name is Corinne Schiff, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Environmental Health at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify on legislation relating to animals. The Health Department is charged with overseeing a range of animal-related activities. We permit and inspect animal shelters, grooming facilities, pet shops, boarding establishments, training facilities, animal exhibitions, and horse stables. We conduct training on small animal handling, issue state-mandated dog licenses, investigate animal nuisance complaints, animal bites and dangerous dog incidents, and monitor wildlife and domestic animals for diseases such as rabies that can impact human health and undertake prevention activities. We host rabies vaccination clinics around the city and provide low-cost spay-neuter services. The department is also responsible for managing and caring for the city's population of owner-surrendered, abandoned, homeless, and lost animals. In 1995, the city created a nonprofit entity, now known, as animal, now known as Animal Care Centers, or ACC, to operate the animal shelter system. 
The services the department carries out through a contract with ACC include receiving and sheltering animals, providing medical services, and animal placement. ACC also performs a vital public safety function by handling potentially dangerous animals and ex accepting suspected rabid animals for observation or preparation for testing. ACC operates full service animal shelters in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, admission centers in the Bronx and Queens, field operations throughout the city, and mobile adoption vans. ACC is required to accept all animals without regard to their condition, age, temperament, or adoptability, and is the only open admission shelter in the city. The administration has been a strong supporter of ACC, committing more than $98 million for capital projects with investment in every borough. This includes a substantial renovation of the Brooklyn Care Center, a new adoption center in Manhattan, which I'm pleased to report just won the Public Design Commission's Excellence in Design Award, and a significantly renovated Staten Island Care Center that is slated to open this fall. Perhaps most exciting, with the support of the Council's state-of-the-art full-service animal shelters are in development in the Bronx and Queens, fulfilling the promise made by the Mayor and City Council to provide a full-service shelter in every borough. I will turn now to the legislation under consideration today. Introduction 1502 would expand the information that the Department reports to the Council regarding city shelter operations and establish a task force to review and advise on shelter best practices. The Department already provides a very detailed report to the Council each year, which includes information on field rescue intakes, transfers, animal outcomes, and shelter staffing. We look forward to discussing with the Council what additional information would be meaningful. As for a task force report, we are skeptical that such an undertaking would yield useful results. As Ms. Weinstock will describe, there have been dramatic improvements in the animal shelter system in the last several years. In 2015, ACC's placement was 80%. Today, ACC is a national leader among municipalities with a 94% placement rate in the current year. Ms. Weinstock and the animal welfare experts who make up her leadership group are at the top of their fields. They are invited to speak around the country, regularly consult with colleagues in New York City and other jurisdictions, and are immersed in the literature and current thinking about best practices. ACC has strong partnerships with animal welfare organizations such as the ASPCA, Best Friends, and hundreds of New Hope organizations, and AS ACC's independent, engaged board of directors has helped increase private fundraising and deepen marketing and promotion strategies. The department is concerned that the time and effort required to convene and run a task force, instruct the members about these best practices, and then to produce a report would be an unnecessary distraction for the important work that ACC carries out every day. Introduction 1496 would require an animal shelter to retrieve an animal when directed by a sheriff or city marshal executing an eviction or legal possession warrant. The department would be happy to work with the sheriff and marshal offices to establish a protocol implementing such a mandate at ACC. However, the department does not know whether the other animal shelters in New York City have the capacity to comply. Introduction 870 would require animal shelters to post photographs and other information about adoptable animals on their website within three days of receiving the animal. The department agrees that techniques such as posting photographs of animals to a website can promote adoption, and Ms. Weinstock can describe ACC's award-winning projects that have done just that. The department doesn't know, however, whether the other animal shelters in the city have websites or sufficient staffing to be able to comply with this requirement, and it may be that in some circumstances a three-day time limit would be inappropriate. We would like to work with the council to be sure this bill promotes adoption. Introduction 1570 would update the Bordetella or kennel cough vaccination requirement at boarding kennels. The department supports these changes which would align the administrative code with the New York City Health Code. Introduction 1477 prohibits veterinarians from declining cats unless the procedure is medically necessary. The department appreciates the council's interest in protecting cats, but the city is not the regulator of veterinary medicine practice. This oversight is a state function, and we note that a similar bill recently passed the state legislature and is awaiting action by the governor. Introduction 1598 would require the department to conduct a public awareness campaign in English and Spanish regard regarding proper disposal of deceased animals. The department has a robust outreach and education program and produces a variety of materials in multiple languages regarding animals and other issues. We look forward to working with the council to better understand what information New Yorkers need about disposal of deceased animals, and we are discussing the bill with the Department of Sanitation, which is responsible for this activity. 
Introduction 1567 would establish civil penalties for animal abuse crimes that are also subject to criminal prosecution, mandate a warning for a first offense for certain crimes, and authorize the department, agents of ASPCA, veterinarians, and others to enforce its provisions. The department manages the city's animal abuse registry and has established relationships with the police department and the five district attorney offices to implement the program. We would like to discuss with the council the intent of this bill to be sure it neither conflicts with state law nor undermines efforts to prosecute people who commit animal abuse. Introduction 1425 would prohibit carriage horses from working when the National Weather Service heat index is 90 or above. The department currently suspends carriage horse activity when the temperature reaches 90 degrees and we monitor the weather closely. We would like to work with the council so that codifying this practice would rely on the equine heat index rather than the National Weather Service index to be sure we tie protections for carriage horses to a species specific heat and humidity standard. Introduction 1202 would prohibit taking wild or otherwise undomesticated birds. The department supports efforts to instill respect for wildlife and prohibit interaction with non-companion animals. We would like to work with the council to be sure this bill does not have unintended consequences, such as prohibiting people from rescuing injured birds and bringing them to care, and that it is consistent with state law requirements governing wildlife matters. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Ms. Weinstock will testify next, and then we will be happy to take questions. Good morning, Chairperson Levine and members of the Health Committee. My name is Risa Weinstock, and I am President and CEO of Animal Care Centers of New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on the proposed bills concerning animal welfare. I would also like to thank everyone for your commitment to the health and welfare of New York City's shelter animals. Over the last five years, ACC has steadily improved thanks to the substantial support of Council the Mayor's Office, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. With your support and the growing community of support from the private sector, ACC has grown to be a leader in the nation for open admission shelters. The future success of ACC is further assured with the City's financial commitment to the construction of state-of-the-art shelters in the Bronx and Queens, as well as much-needed renovation of our existing facilities. ACC is unique among all animal shelters in New York City because we are open admissions, meaning we accept any animal brought to our five locations, whether the animal has been abandoned, surrendered, found astray, brought in by the public, NYPD, or our animal rescue team, and regardless of age, health, breed, species, temperament, or physical condition. We not only accept and seek placement for companion animals, but also wildlife, birds, reptiles, and farm animals. We operate three full-service animal care centers located in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, and two resource centers located in the Bronx and Queens, respectively. We are open seven days a week to the public and provide 24-hour care to our animals. Our field, field rescue team is on call 24 hours a day, for animal emergencies throughout the city. We also work to root out causes of animal homelessness or abandonment. For families that may be struggling with issues affecting their ability to keep their pet, we offer an array of resources, including owner surrender prevention counseling, free and local vaccine clinics, vouchers for low cost or free spay neuter and medical services, and free basic obedience training. I want to thank City Council for the additional $3 million provided to ACC this past fiscal year. This allowed us to add three new vehicles to further grow our outreach efforts, including a mobile adoption vehicle to serve Queens, a vehicle to support our community pets program and vaccine clinics, and a third vehicle to support deeper community outreach. The funding was also used to staff these programs as well as hire additional medical staff, purchase medical supplies and equipment, and to add safety and security features to our facilities. ACC is always open, which means we are always busy, always working, and always problem solving. In calendar year 2018, ACC took in over 28,000 animals, or roughly 75 animals each day. And while that is a daunting number of animals, ACC has one of the best placement rates in the nation for a shelter of our size, 94% in the current year. 
the team that has elevated ACC and New York City to this historic position is made up of over 280 compassionate, talented, and caring professionals. For an overview of our work and impact year to date, I ask you to refer to the 2019 community report on the back page of my testimony. ACC is very proud to have recently been awarded a 34-year contract to continue to provide animal services to New York City. Over the next 34 years, ACC and animal sheltering in New York City will continue to dramatically change and evolve as we incorporate state-of-the-art shelters in the Bronx and Queens, undergo significant renovation of our existing facilities, and continue to implement innovative solutions designed to yield the best outcomes for the most animals in our care. The remainder of my testimony focuses on intro 1502, specifically the requirement for additional reporting and the creation of a task force to develop best practices for animal shelters. ACC provides detailed data to DOH, which then annually, annually reports to the City Council. We welcome the opportunity to work with Council to identify any additional information that would be meaningful. Concerning the proposal for a task force to develop best practices in animal sheltering, there already exists a wide field of animal sheltering and welfare expertise comprised of industry professionals. ACC follows industry best practices, including guidelines for standards of care in animal shelters published by the Association of Shelter Veterinarians. ACC's decisions are informed by these industry standards and the advice of our mentors in the field. Our own team also includes professionals who are experts in animal sheltering, are certified or licensed in their fields of expertise, have master degrees in animal welfare, and decades of experience in animal behavior, sheltering, and shelter medicine. The nation's animal welfare leaders, including the ASPCA, Maddie's Fund, HSUS, Best Friends, the University of Wisconsin, UC Davis Court School of Veterinary Medicine, the Petco Foundation, PetSmart Charities, and the Association for Animal Welfare and Advancement have recognized ACC for our progressive work. These leaders have worked with ACC on multiple pilot projects to analyze complex animal sheltering issues and develop standards for other shelters. ACC could not have progressed this far if we were not acutely aware of industry best practices or we did not commit to attaining the industry gold standards. In many cases, we are setting best practices for other organizations to follow. For example, we were one of the first municipal sheltering organizations of our size to successfully implement the dog playgroup model as a life-saving measure. We were also one of the pioneers in offering a robust surrender prevention program to our clients, many of whom lack access to affordable veterinary resources. We have been honored multiple times by national standard setting organizations, have been invited to speak at their conferences across the United States, and received grant funding specifically earmarked for the implementation of gold standard programs. There is no shortage of opinion and emotion in animal welfare but it should not supplant fact-based dialogue or be used to second-guess the professionals who set national standards, nor the qualified in-house team that works directly with our animals inside the care centers. Opportunities for input from the public currently exist. Our board meetings are open to the public. We regularly testify before City Council and the Health Committee at oversight hearings, and we respond to public inquiry on a regular basis. ACC's board is made up of private individuals, several of whom are appointed by the mayor and city officials, all of whom question, review, and direct our operations. I encourage the health committee to come for a tour, meet our staff, attend one of our community pet vaccine and wellness clinics, stop by a mobile adoption event, or simply adopt or foster one of our animals you will quickly understand the depth of our compassion, the meaning of our work, and the positive impact that ACC is making as we work to end animal homelessness in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you to all three of our administration <clears throat> representatives today. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by fellow health committee member Councilmember Alika Ampri-Samuel, as well as 
fellow health committee member and one of our bill sponsors today, Keith Powers. Uh, President Weinstock, could you update us on the shelter development in Queens and the Bronx? Currently in Queens and the Bronx, uh, sites have been selected. ACC is managing the uh, construction and design of the Queens project, so I can speak more specifically about that. Uh, we've identified property we haven't yet closed. Um, we've worked with the community board. We're going to engage with the public and the community um, in that district. We expect to start work. Uh, it is an environmental site. We expect to start work soon after the closing, which is schedu scheduled for sometime this week, early next week. With an opening date of? Uh, the anticipated opening date is 2024. And for the Bronx? I defer to my colleague, Christine Quinn, on that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Excuse me, Christine Kim. Uh, the Bronx is also scheduled to uh, open in 2024. Uh, let me just correct that. Queens is scheduled for 2022 to be open. So that will, be, that will precede the Bronx. And the Bronx is scheduled for 2024. That's correct. OK. Uh, direct, uh, President Weinstock, what is the average time that an animal spends in an ACC shelter before either release or, uh, in the worst case, euthanasia? On average, animals are placed um, and adopted within seven days, and these are averages. Animals that have been euthanized on average have spent 12 days at ACC. Um, and you have touched on this many times before, but I do think it's important to, to uh, confirm again, what are the circumstances under which you would euthanize an animal? Euthanasia is not a decision that anybody takes lightly. We are a national leader at 94% placement. So we're looking at the 6% of the animals in our care that um, are either at risk or have been euthanized. Those animals, right now what we're seeing, those animals have behavior issues. Euthanasia decisions are really based on health and behavior and it can be a combination of both, but the majority of animals that are at risk for euthanasia have serious behavior issues. Meaning you have deemed them to be unsafe to the public or to other animals? Well, they, are, they have behavioral challenges. We spend, during that 12 day period, we spend the time trying to find the appropriate placement for that animal. Most of the animals with behavior issues, if they're severe, could not be placed with the public, so they would not be candidates for adoption. Then we move to our over 300 um, partners in what we call New Hope Partnership. These are rescue groups that have uh, resources um, and a network of fosters to try and find homes that are more suitable for animals with behavioral issues. When we have animals with behavioral issues that do not have placement, they are at risk of euthanasia, and if we cannot find placement for them, or if they are a danger to, to the community, or to individuals, or even to our staff, they, they are euthanized. So there are some animals with behavioral challenges which you will post for adoption. Uh, of course, you want the potential adoptee to understand the challenges, and there are some animals where the behavioral issues are more serious, and you don't post them for adoption, you transfer them to one of the, the new, help shelter, new help shelters, is that correct? We will post every animal, even if they have a behavior issue, with the exception that those that have been deemed dangerous dogs, which are animals that are not safe or suitable for the public. It is our goal to place, so we want the best outcome for the most animals. So there is no set time limit. It's really based on our observation of behavior and what's happening um, in, in our care. And any information that we've gotten either from the prior owner um, or just direct observation by the people in our... In and our what, what portion of the animals are ultimately determined to be a danger to the public? Is it one or two percent? The ones that don't have any placement, yes. Yes, about one or two percent are deemed dangerous. So of the six percent that are euthanized, 
but close to a third were determined to be a danger to the public. Yes. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. How much time are animals posted for adoption publicly? As soon as an animal comes into the shelter, we post their photo within hours. And if they're a candidate for adoption, that information will continue to be updated um, on our website. We have a mobile app for adoptions, and we continue to pr promote as much information as we have for that animal. If the animal's not available for adoption, you will not see them posted on our website. And they may not be available for adoption because of what we just discussed. They are considered dangerous dogs. They may be going directly to one of our rescue partners. They may be um, too sick to be considered for public adoption. But every animal that comes in gets a photo and their information gets posted within hours of intake. Okay, I will come back to you and, and the rest of the panel for questions in a moment, but first I'm gonna be very unchair-like and quickly turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we'll be hearing from Council Members Cabrera, Rivera, Holden, and Powers, among others. And um, colleagues, we are gonna have to use a clock only because we have, I think at this point, over 100 people who wanna speak. Um, and I am going to ask Council Member Holden to kick us off. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Weinstock, I, I appreciate, I, you know, I love ACC, by the way. They're, I visited your shelter and uh, love what you're doing. I like the increased adoptions. In fact, I adopted Rocky, my office cat. Um, and he, he's got more followers on Twitter than I do, but that's all right. He gets more likes. Uh, and, um, I, you know, we just, we're, we're looking at the public, um, and we talked about the social media, um, the perception of ACC, and getting more information out. And that seems to be the problem, um, where information goes out, but we have advocates who are saying, you're not doing a great job. We're not doing the best we can do. And we need, so that means there needs to be better communications. So what I'm concerned, that's why we created so we're thinking about an oversight committee or somebody else, an independent body to come in and just check on things. Just so it's not just you saying you're doing a great job or you know, these national organizations you know, saying you're doing a wonderful job. It's also people of New York City and, and experts saying ACC is great. We're an independent body. We're not associated with ACC. We love what you're doing to the, with the animals. We, we love how you're taking care of them. We love how you're adopting them. So that, it, and again, we can discuss this, what that looks like, but that may be a way where people then would believe you because there is another organization. We, we talked about the social media, and we know how social media can blow up things and maybe twist things. We know that that's possible because of misinformation. So. Wouldn't, wouldn't you, I know you, you don't really support it, I, you spoke to me about it, about this task force, but could there be something else then? Could be, there be a middle ground? We are, we welcome the opportunity for transparency. I think um, the issue with the bill is the setting of best practices by um, individuals who are compassionate about animal welfare, but don't have the knowledge or the experience that's necessary to set those best practices and standards. With respect to offering information or understanding, I would suggest the best way to understand or offer that type of information is to engage with us the way that you have engaged with us. You, um, I would suggest that people come in and take a tour and sit down and talk to us and get to understand the types of decisions that we're making. It's a very hands-on, um, I think the most hands-on information and opportunity that we give to individuals who are concerned about our uh, practices, the better. I don't think that a task force with, without rolling up their sleeves and really coming to see everything that ACC is doing will be productive. 
in particular, setting best practices for an animal shelter that's taking in 28,000 animals, not, and it's not only about the adoption of dogs and cats and rabbits. At any moment in time, we're also changing gears to deal with a cow or 70 chickens or a hoarding case. It, so there's a constant flow of activity that changes our direction. And um, I really think that it's important for the animal welfare professionals to set the best practice standards for municipal open admission shelters. Yeah, I, all right, I'd like to, I don't want to discuss it right now at the second, but I think we can, I think, come up with a solution where the better information is getting out and there's an oversight, at least people coming in and just describing what they see and evaluating ACC, just uh, you know, here and there. I, and I think that could, that could be positive. I'm not sure you know, that, uh, I, I know that you know, some people feel threatened, but I think it might, it might be a solution to, to create a body, an oversight body, just to look at it. But how many, you said you had board meetings where the public can attend. How many board meetings a year do you have? We have a board meeting twice a year in January and in June. January and June, okay. And um, where are they located? Are they? They're generally located in um, a building that the Department of Health occupies. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask the Commissioner um, Schiff to, to talk about, um, do, do you think that the public knows how to dispose of a deceased animal? Um, no, I, I actually don't. I don't know. We wanted to discuss with the council. That's. The, I understand that's your your bill, and so wanted to understand better the knowledge gap um, that New Yorkers have, and what kind of educational campaign would be helpful. It may be that my colleagues at the Depa Department of Sanitation might know more. It, this uh, this activity is their um, responsibility, but happy to talk more about what else, what other information can be provided to New Yorkers. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my time's up, so I'll I'll yield. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Next, uh, we'll hear from Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to the uh, Chair. I know I only have five minutes, uh, so let me get to the point. Uh, I noticed that you didn't mention intro 1498. Is this a particular reason why it was not mentioned? Uh, simply, it's a bill that will require NYPD to publish some, some annual reports and complaints and investigations of animal cruelty allegations. There was a mention of it in my testimony, and okay. the administration and NYPD does support increased. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, can you let me know why briefly it's taking so long for, you know, the Bronx, we always feel we're the last one to get anything. And why do we have to wait all the way into 2024 to get it, what everybody else already have? Um, we are working as expeditiously as possible and um, looking for every opportunity to save time. Um, we agree that we would like these shelters to open up as soon as possible. But I see Queens is going to get in 2022. What is it that is stopping you from being able, the administration, from being able to have it at the same time? I mean, it shouldn't take five years. Um, thank you for that question. So the Queen's Animal Shelter is actually uh, being managed by animal care centers and the Bronx Animal Shelter is a city project. And because it's a city project, we have to go through all the, the checks and balances, which um, takes a lot of time. Well, we'll hope that uh, there will be a way to expedite because it's been literally, you know, and I know you're for it, but it's literally long overdue. Uh, my last question is because I, I didn't get from, at least from my end, and I don't have your testimony here, um, so I couldn't go back. When it comes to the frog rot uh, bill, uh, Council Member Rivera, uh, are you for it? Not sure or against it? Uh, the mayor supports the humane treatment of animals and the administration has a very strong track record of supporting animal welfare legislation. We support the intent of this ban because the mayor does support the humane treatment of animals. So the intent or do you support the bill as it is? 
we support the humane treatment of animals and the intent of this ban. Okay. So if, uh, if and when we pass this bill, right, uh, and it comes to the mayor's desk, is the mayor prepared to sign it? We would like to continue conversations with council on some of the uh, language in the bill, um, but we do support the intent of this ban. Okay, I appreciate your answer. Uh, from my end, I think it's a disgusting, inhumane practice that we have uh, that needs to stop like ASAP. I just can't believe, I didn't even know this practice existed uh, in the city, other cities across uh, uh, the United States and other countries has already gotten rid of this practice. I think the time is now, and I fully support my colleague, and thank you for championing uh, this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. And next, I'd like to cue Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Chair Levine, for giving me the opportunity to ask a couple questions. I have two bills today, and they both uh, have been introduced, drafted, and, and consulted with numerous stakeholders in response to constituent concerns and experiences. So we mentioned um, the foie gras bill, and again, this is all about the ethical, humane treatment of animals, and this bill specifically Ha is addressing the inhumane method of gavage, which is just, if you've seen any of the videos, it is horrifying and it is certainly um, emblazoned in, in my brain in, in terms of what the animals are going through. So I know, Ms. Kim, you said that you support the intent or the spirit of the bill and the humane treatment of animals. Do you um, have any other information regar regarding foie gras that the administration has put forward in terms of, do you know of alternative ways to get these poultry products without force feeding the animals? It is our understanding that the production of foie gras does involve the force feeding of birds um, in all methods of production. So we support the intent of this bill. It, it is uh, the force feeding of birds. In fact, veterinarians have determined this overfeeding process poses numerous health risks to birds, including liver disease, bacterial and fungal infection, potential damage to the esophagus, as well as a number of other disease and stress-related issues. So what I am trying to do is put forward a bill that would end this practice and create a more humane New York City to live in. So I, I would love to continue talking with you about this. You'll hear from a number of people today, and we want to hear from every single person affected. Um, this is something that is truly a luxury product. It is served in roughly 1% of New York City restaurants, and there are alternatives. We can be a better city and still have amazing experiences. I want to ask you, Ms. Schiff, about intro 1202 while I still have time. So in your testimony, you mentioned specifically that the bill does not, to make sure that this bill does not have unintended consequences such as prohibiting people from rescuing injured birds and bringing them to care. Have you ever seen a netting of birds? Have you ever seen one of these um, instances, these examples that we've described to you today? Uh, I have not seen, but I have heard. And I understand that that's what the bill is targeting, and we think that it will provide some additional tools for NYPD. So we'd like to just talk with you to make sure uh, that the definitions uh, in the bill don't have unintended consequences. That's what the testimony was, was uh, designed to indicate. Because we have a number of, of people that support us, and, and we certainly want to encourage people to bring animals into the organizations that care for them. And this is particularly happening in my district in Tompkins Square Park, um, in Washington Square Park. And they are being taken to other states for use in sport shooting. We realize that it is already illegal to grab uh, animals off the street, but this is to increase the penalties for something that is illegal and something that should not be happening in New York City. And I always tell people, regardless of how you feel about pigeons, they are animals. This is about humane treatment, being a cruelty-free NYC, and they are central to the core of New York City. I just want to add that. So. Um, 
I, I'm interested in, in, in working with you to really talk about how we can make sure that we are doing this the right way. Again, we have a number of, of advocacy organizations who are supporting us, and I want to make sure that uh, we work together. So I, I really have a lot of questions for the advocates and for the other stakeholders in the room, so I want to thank you for your testimony, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rivera. Next up, we'll be hearing from Councilmember Powers. Great, thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, I want to ask on uh, the bill related to uh, introduction to 1425 related to the horse carriages, um, which uh, you had mentioned that you had thought that the, the testimony from the DOH mentioned working with the council so the practice would rely on the, the a different heat index rather than National Weather Service Index. And can you speak more specifically about what you're asking for there and um, what the difference is between the one that's being proposed and what you're asking for? Sure. Um, so what, what we're suggesting, and we'd like to come back to you with some more details once we've had um, a little more time to work through this, is that the goal of the legislation, as we understand it, is to introduce a humidity consideration into the uh, the trigger for when uh, horse carriage activity is suspended. Right now, the ad code addresses temperature only, and this bill would include would would um, have uh, that trigger include a humidity determination. The bill uh, would use the National Weather Service. Uh, tool and we're suggesting that instead there isn't there is a tool that is specifically about horses and so we would suggest that that, that tool be what's used and what we'd like to do is um, uh, we're, we've started working on this now to see how that how the equine heat index is used in other contexts where horses work so we're taking a look at that and then we'd want to come back to you with a recommendation for what that trigger would be under this heat index so it's really just swapping out a tool one tool designed really for humans and the other tool that is designed for horses and then we can work together to figure out what that what that trigger would be and and is there a specific number that the the agency administration suggests as where that cutoff should happen under the under the measurement that you're you're requesting so we don't have a number now. Um, we've started to work on uh, to work on this. Um, if the council is open to considering the equine heat index as a, an alternative um, species specific uh, tool, then we'll continue that work. We'll take a look at some of the other contexts and bring to you how what we would suggest and the rationale for that, and then we can have that conversation. And under the current proposal, do you have a estimate for how many days a year? Would, there would be, they would exceed the threshold when you include the humidity factor? Uh, we did not, we did not model that. You I do not, no, don't we, have it. We don't know, if I understand your question, we don't know how many additional days, say for summer 2018, how many additional suspensions. We didn't do that modeling. Perhaps okay. the council has done that and we would be happy to, we would be interested to see that. And, and do you have under the model you're proposing any idea of how many less days would be uh, people would be available to work under that and the, the horses would be taken off the streets? So we, again, we don't have a number. Um, what we'd like to do is, is take a look at some of these other areas where horses work, um, think about that in terms of this, uh, this work context, bring that back to you, and then I think that that point is an, is an important one and, and um, I would imagine that the council has some idea, having chosen 90, um, how many additional suspensions you would be interested in seeing, and so we can have that conversation and, and land on the right number. Great, thank you. And can you just tell where um, the, the, the equine heat index, can you talk about where that's being used today in other places where, where that's sure. so, so for example, um, in an agricultural setting or a horse competitive setting, these other contexts. And we're continuing to look and, and we'll pull as many different contexts as we can. So the point being that the National Weather Index would measure what a human feels that measures in other settings what a horse's temperature or animal's temperature would be? Correct. Okay. Um, and can you just talk about the process under the current proposal? As I understand it today, they take the temp, you know, I think it's the NYPD mounted unit, I think takes the temperature. When, it's, when it exceeds 90 degrees, they go out and they, they, they tell a course carriage that they can't operate that, for that period of time where it exceeds 90 degrees temperature. Can you talk about a little bit the process that would occur if we changed it in terms of how, the, how notification would happen and how measurement would happen? 
So currently, uh, horse carriage activity has to be suspended when the temperature reaches 90 degrees. We work very closely with NYPD. We have a weather station in Central Park. When that temperature threshold is met, uh, both we and NYPD have handheld um, weather meters. We are out um, where the horse activity is to take that temperature reading. And when that 90 degrees is reached, then the activity is suspended. We place calls. We have contacts at all of the stables, so we place calls to alert them. Um, we have a texting service, and um, uh, nearly all the drivers have signed up for that, so a text alert goes back. And when that happens, the, the horse carriages have to return um, to the stable. Um, if they're in the middle of a ride, uh, they don't need to, the tourists don't have to exit in the middle of the park. They can, they have 30 minutes to finish that ride, and then the, the horses have an opportunity for rest and water and then have to return to the stable. Um, is, should we include a humidity factor into that threshold for suspension? We would follow the very same protocol. Our, uh, our handheld uh, weather meters that we and NYPD have are able to monitor humidity. So I don't, I don't foresee, I mean, as we get deeper into this and think through it, there, you know, we'll come back to you if there are changes, but I, I foresee generally the same, the same protocol would be in place. Okay, my time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. And now we'll hear from Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Um, as you know, I support all of the bills. I'm very excited to see them shepherd through the council. I do want to note that you did not mention anything about my resolution for Meatless Mondays, and I just want to confirm that there are no concerns on behalf of the administration. There are absolutely no concerns. Um, the mayor has enacted many Meatless Mondays initiatives already, and he um, also, uh, as part of the Green New Deal, the administration is phasing out uh, beef processed meat purchases and also reducing beef purchases by 50%. Um, these are all measures that are taken for the health and wellness of New Yorkers and also for environmental sustainability and for animal welfare. Okay, thank you very much. I defer the re remainder of my time to Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you, council members, for uh, your brevity and for your yielding of time. And we have over 100 members of the public who want to testify. So we are going to move on to our first panel. I thank the administration for your testimony. And for those who are new to council hearings, we try and organize panels by uh, perspective and interest area. Um, we're going to make sure everybody with every perspective on all these issues is heard. And we're going to try and keep this moving very quickly. I'm going to call the first panel, which can, uh, includes Jenny Coffey of Animal Haven, Michelle Villagomez of the ASPCA, Cami Strauss, also ASPCA, Jennifer Sense, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, ASPCA, Felicia. Manya Terra, ASPCA, and uh, Melissa Truman, um, not sure the organization, and we'll ask you to come up. We are going to have a two minute clock for public testimony, again, to accommodate the extraordinary number of people who want to testify. Okay, you may begin. Is this on? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa Truman, Director of Brand Communications at Baidui, speaking on behalf of Leslie Granger, our President and CEO. Baidui is a 116-year-old animal welfare organization with three locations, one in Manhattan and two on Long Island. Baidui is a selective intake shelter that does approximately 1,700 adoptions annually from our New York and West Hampton centers. We are a New Hope partner and pull dogs and cats, many in need of urgent medical care, from ACNC, 
including from their Staten Island location, because many of our animals are rescued from abuse, neglect, or abandonment and arrive at the shelter in need of medical care before they are available for adoption. They're often not feeling or looking their best upon arrival. Many of them come to us after losing the only family they've ever known and are initially terrified. Some spend days hiding before they feel comfortable enough to allow handling and photos. Our staff works incredibly hard to showcase our animals in the best possible light so that they have the greatest potential to attract adopters. Many people look for their next family member online from adoption sites like PetFinder as well as from our own website. And seeing images of animals looking in dire need of care or cowering in the back of the cage does little to entice people into the shelter to adopt. We work extremely hard to change public perceptions about what adopting a shelter pet means, and to have to post images within an arbitrary time frame means many of these images will suffer, as will our animals. This will potentially mean longer stays for animals, less foot traffic into our shelter, and an increased likelihood that potential adopters will go elsewhere to adopt, or worse, purchase a pet. Putting arbitrary time constraints before the medical care, behavior care, and well-being of our animals is counterintuitive to our mission as an animal welfare group. We believe that every animal deserves to be highlighted at their very best in order to increase their chances of finding a forever home. I'll wrap up. Bad photos have been proven to suppress adoption numbers, and our mission is to increase adoption numbers and save more lives. This bill would restrict our ability to do that and do a disservice to the 1,700 animals we rescue every year. Thank you for giving thank me the Thank you. We appreciate your perspective, and thank you for adhering to the time limit. Please. Hi there. My name is Jenny Coffey. I'm speaking on behalf of Animal Haven's Executive Director, Tiffany Lisi. Animal Haven is a small shelter with a mission to find homes for abandoned dogs and cats. We serve approximately 1,000 animals each year. While we regularly assist the animal care centers as New Hope partner, Animal Haven receives no city funding and we are not contracted with the city to provide animal services. We're here today to, to oppose the proposed 870. This bill would be negative to our organization. It would it wouldn't help animals get adopted. And it would serve as a tax because we would actually have to hire somebody to, to comply with it. Simply put, requiring Animal Haven to photograph and document all animals for adoption within a city determined time frame would mean that we'd focus primarily on intake with little consideration for the outcomes for which we strive. The photographs would be little more than mug shots, and the descriptions would fail to tell the accurate story. Today, Animal Haven is seen as, as a leading shelter. It elevates animal welfare to a new standard. Our website does showcase a selection of animals, and we conduct additional marketing to draw people to come to visit. We promote these animals as quickly as possible, but we're not set on any specific time frame. Our communications with adopters is sophisticated and our marketing is strategic and intentional. We've incorporated new philosophies that suggest adopters don't want to be overwhelmed with poor quality snapshots of sad animals, but they're searching for a connection with a pet. We no longer post kittens and puppies because they get adopted quickly. And we've moved away from using intake pictures for exactly the same reason as my colleague does. They don't offer adoption as, a, as an opportunity. It actually deters people. Um, I will close up. Um, I'd also like to remind everybody that Anim Animal Haven is a small shelter like many other animal programs in the city. Our staff is 12, so that means we wear so many different hats. Our marketing director is our photographer, our website manager, and many other roles. This, would, this work would detract from our, our mission, it would limit our success and serve as a financial tax for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Hi, I'm Dr. Felicia Magnatera. I'm a shelter veterinarian and manager with the ASPCA Adoption Center. The ASPCA does not support Intro 870. 
This bill would lead to welfare, operational, and resource challenges that will increase length of stay for our animals in our care, which is in turn going to prolong their time in the shelter and directly work against the mission of the organization. We do not operate as a lost and found or an open admissions shelter. Our population is un uniquely different than any shelter population in the country because of the community outreach in New York City and the NYPD re relationship that is established. Every week, animals are examined at intake and placed immediately on the floor for adoption where the public can see them the very same day. It is not uncommon for these fast-track animals, those not in need of significant medical or behavior intervention, to get adopted the same day they arrive in the shelter. We also regularly have animals in our care for less than three days. So the pet will have an intake examination with the veterinarian on day one, go and get spayed or neutered on day two, and then get adopted on day three. Thank you. Um, a mandate to photograph and post photos of these animals is a drain on our organizational resources and time that can be spent helping more animals in the New York City community. We currently manage a variety of sensitive patient cases, ranging from abuse, neglect, hoarding, and often with NYPD legal origins. These particular pets have been traumatized by their previous situations and experiences. They require a special approach to acclimate them slowly to a new environment where they are comfortable enough to come out just to form basic functions in the shelter setting. Photographing an animal in this condition is not only difficult, requiring additional resources to achieve successfully, but it can also be a significant setback to the progress made during the pet's acclimation into the shelter from both a behavioral and a welfare standpoint. I just want to close up by saying that we recommend before further action is taken into intro 870 that the council work with the animal shelters in the community to find a better way to address the aims of this bill. We look forward to sharing our expertise and continue to work to improve conditions for New York City's animals. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Hello, my name is Jenny Lintz, and I'm the director of the Puppy Mill Initiatives at the ASPCA. On behalf of our organization and New York members, I would like to thank Councilman Brannon for introducing Resolution 798 in support of A6298 slash S4234, which would prohibit the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits in pet stores across the state. In 2015, New York City took a stand to keep puppies from some of the worst breeders in the country out of our pet shops by prohibiting the use of dog brokers or middlemen. Unfortunately, it appears that pet stores continue to buy from such brokers. This bold defiance is not unexpected. This is an industry that makes money off buying and reselling puppies, relying on aggressive and deceptive sales tactics, exploiting the emotional connection that people feel towards animals. We're living in an era now where New York's pet stores are almost completely geographically disconnected from these suppliers. Import records demonstrate that overwhelmingly, pet stores are selling puppies from licensed wholesale breeders or dog brokers from states like Missouri, Iowa, and Ohio. These operations consistently prioritize profit over responsible humane care and are permitted by our federal government to remain in business even after documented violations. But even those that are in full compliance with the Animal Welfare Act can legally keep dogs in wire bottom cages just six inches longer than the dog in each direction, stacked on top of each other. In a further blow to transparency, in 2017, the USDA abruptly removed thousands of animal welfare records, including inspe inspection reports, enforcement actions, and other information from its website. And that information remains unavailable today. By obstructing access to this data, the USDA removed critical protections from animals who need them most. This means, without inspection reports, there is no way to independently determine which licensees have violations, rendering our sourcing efforts ineffective. There are hundreds of pet stores in New York, both large and small, selling food, supplies, and services to millions of pet owning families throughout the state. Those are the businesses we want in New York. It's time to limit the ability of puppy mills to profit from cruelty and improve the lives of thousands of dogs. Please pass Resolution 798. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Michelle Villagomez, New York City Legislative Senior Director for the ASPCA. I'd like to thank the Health Committee and Chairman Levine for hosting this hearing on such varied animal-related legislation 
and all your efforts to make New York City a more humane community. We appreciate the opportunity to share our expertise to help inform your work and offer our position on the following bills. Resolution 921, uh, we support Resolution 921 in support of providing a tax credit to taxpayers who adopt their pets from a shelter. The Council should commit to the goal of incentivizing adoptions of homeless pets. The ASPCA has invested millions of dollars into both the city and the state's sheltering infrastructure to help increase adoption rates. And we believe this measure will inspire New Yorkers to adopt their next pet. We thank Council Member Cumbo for her leadership in urging state lawmakers to enact A286, which would make New York State the first in the nation to provide a tax credit for shelter adoptions. We support Intro 1570, Council Member Levine's bill to require that the owners of dogs being accepted at boarding kennel businesses or establishments show proof of active immunization against Bordetella. This bill would clarify the Bordetella vaccine requirement to reflect manufacturer recommendations and current veterinary best practices. Current law requires the vaccine to be administered every six months, which conflicts with manufacturer recommendations. We support Intro 1425, Council Member Powers' bill to make it unlawful for carriage horses to work when the heat index reaches or exceeds 90 degrees. Um, by law, carriage horses may be worked nine hours a day in temperatures ranging from a low of 18 to a high of 90 degrees, not taking into account wind chill factor or humidity. We believe that using horses to pull carriages through very busy and loud city streets is unsafe and an undeniable strain on the horse's quality of life, and we support efforts to address the working and living conditions of the carriage horses and support this step. We support Councilmember Holden's resolution um, in support of the uh, Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture, Torture Act. And I'm just gonna add in additionally, um, in uh, Intro 1567, there is language that still keeps the ASPCA as an enforcer. And um, I would recommend removing that. ASPCA has turned over animal cruelty enforcement to the NYPD. Thank you so much uh, for your opportunity to talk to you today and considering all of these really important measures. Thank you, Michelle. An important point of, of changeover of enforcement jurisdiction. And we appreciate uh, all your positions. Did you uh, offering testimony as well, correct? I am. Okay, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carrie Strauss, and I'm sharing testimony on behalf of the ASPCA and Daisy Freund, the director of our Farm Animal Welfare Department, who couldn't be here. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today in support of Resolution 379, which would recognize Meatless Monday in New York City, and share our position on banning the sale of poultry products from force-fed birds. While the ASPCA is widely known for a long history of work with companion animals, we are also dedicated to reducing farm animal suffering by promoting higher welfare farming practices, increasing public awareness about how to make welfare conscious purchasing decisions. We work nationwide to build a more humane and transparent farming system through consumer education, corporate collaboration, support for more humane farmers, and legislative initiatives that support higher welfare practices on farms. We know that um, a more compassionate farming system is possible and we are working hard to make it the way of the future. A big piece of this work is educating the public. In addition to encouraging consumers to select products with meaningful animal welfare certifications, we recognize the importance of plant-based eating and encourage consumers to try to get more plant-based foods on their plates. Replacing meat with plant-based options, even just one day a week, as Meatless Monday calls for, has huge benefits for animals, people, and the planet. We're grateful to Council Member Rosenthal and excited to see that the Council is considering this resolution. We would be thrilled for New York City to join its public school system and cities across the country in adopting Meatless Monday. Doing so would further cement this city's commitment to building a healthier and more humane food system. The ASPCA's farm animal work is rooted in improving conditions for farm animals and getting rid of the cruelest practices used on farms. To that end, we oppose the forcible feeding of farm animals, including force feeding for the production of foie gras. This practice, which generally involves feeding birds by inserting long pipes into their throats, causes distress, acute pain, injury, and chronic health complications. Consuming unnaturally large quantities of corn and fat causes the bird's livers to become diseased with hepatic lipidosis and swell to 10 or more times their normal size. These diseased livers are then harvested during slaughter and marketed as foie gras. A recent poll found that 81% of New Yorkers support a ban on the sale um, of foie gras from force-fed birds. Prohibiting this inherently cruel practice used to produce a luxury food item should be common sense for the council, and we encourage you to move forward with the initiative to prohibit the sale of products from force-fed birds in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I wonder whether either of our independent shelters, by the way, or Animal Haven, has a position on our bill to require vaccination for uh, Bordadella, whooping cough, uh, 
Kennel cough. I'm speaking on behalf of our president and CEO, so I personally wouldn't want to, to speak to that. I just wouldn't want to misspeak. And Animal Haven would likely defer to the ASPCA for recommendations in that way. I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by fellow health committee member, council member Inez Barron, as well as fellow health committee member, Dr. Matthew Eugene, council member. Thank you. Okay, okay. council member Rivera has a question. Thank you uh, for testifying um, on behalf of uh, intro 1378 and your support of it. Do you know of alternative ways to get the poultry products without force feeding the animals? Do you have that info? I do not. I am actually not a subject matter expert. I was presenting this testimony on behalf of our director of farm animal welfare. So your director of animal welfare is part of a larger coalition in supporting um, this, this bill. We're doing a little swap. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Our director of farm animal welfare is currently in Italy, <laughs> so uh, unfortunately she wasn't able to be here. But we can get you that information. Um, this is part of a larger network of work. Um, as Carrie mentioned, um, we do uh, work looking at like farm certification, uh, animal welfare standards in terms of you know uh, the criteria to look at when consumers are making choices at the supermarket. We have. Uh, an arm that works with corporations to try to improve their animal welfare practices. So I'd be glad to get you some additional information on, on the foie gras piece when, when she returns. Yes, uh, that would be great. I've, I've received a ton of information over the past few months, but I, I'm willing to take in anything in terms of what you've seen abroad, what we can do better here in New York, and I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera, and thank you to this panel. We're now going to move on to our next panel. I'll ask them to start making their way up. Ali Feldman-Taylor of Voters for Animal Rights. Dr. Mary Marimoto from the Veterinary Medical Association of New York City. Heather Greenhouse, Voters for Animal Rights. Esther Coslow from Shelter Reform Action Committee. Nora Constance Marino from Animal Cruelty Exposure Fund of Queens County. Would you like to kick us off? Sure. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mari Morimoto, and I am representing the Veterinary Medical Association of New York City, which I will now call VMA NYC. I am a veterinarian licensed in the state of New York, and I am a member at large of the executive board of the VMA NYC. We are the regional professional association of veterinarians residing and or practicing in the five boroughs, and we've been serving the profession, the New York City community, and all animals, both owned and otherwise, since 1879. We just celebrated our 140th anniversary. I want to thank Chair Levine and the Health Committee for allowing us to provide testimony today. Uh, there should be written testimony being passed out because I realize I have a time limit. I plan to speak on two pieces. The first is intro 1570 2019, which will unify and make consistent New York City's requirement regarding border telemunization for dogs. Uh, pertaining to any dog entering boarding, training, grooming, or other animal service facility in the city. There, there are two current regulations. They contradict one another, and we're hoping that this will unify them. The Boarding Kennel Regulation Act says that um, requires proof of vaccination against Bordetella, among other vaccinations, but for Bordetella during the previous six months, whereas Article 161 of the Health Code currently actively vaccinated is the language used, and that is uh, defined elsewhere, elsewhere in the health code as administered according to manufacturer instructions. So manufacturers do conduct vaccine efficacy trials that must be validated and approved by the USDA, and all currently licensed Bortel vaccines in the United States have vaccination instructions for a yearly basis, and there has been no scientific evidence to suggest more frequent vaccinations beyond manufacturer recommendations provides any additional protection from infection with Bortella, 
In addition, the term often used kennel cough refers to upper respiratory conditions. Only one of the causes of agents being Bordetella, there are many other pathogens which are not covered by most Bordetella vaccines. Therefore, we feel that this is the best interest that allow the veterinarian to provide care that is consistent with manufacturer recommendation. The other was intro 1478, but I will answer questions about that separately since I'm out of time. Thank you, doctor. We appreciate that. Thank you. Allie. My name is Allie Feldman-Taylor, and I'm the president of Voters for Animal Rights. We proudly support intro 1378 to ban the sale of foie gras, and for which I'm very grateful that my council member, Alika Amphrey Samuel, has co-sponsored. Um, I'm going to defer any more discussion um, from me on intro 1378 to my colleagues who are going to be talking about this later on in the hearing. Um, we also support intro 1202 to increase penalties for stealing wild birds, intro 1425 to protect carriage horses from excessive summer heat, and Rezo 379 to endorse Meatless Mondays in New York City. Um, also encouraging the council to adopt Rezo 798. Um, this is vital legislation to reduce pet overpopulation and irresponsible breeding in New York City. Um, and last, we urge the council to pass intro 1477, which puts an end to the unnecessary mutilation of cats purely, from human, purely for human convenience. I'm a mom myself of six rescued cats, a professional cat setter, manager of a feral cat colony, and a volunteer for neighborhood trap neuter release programs in Bedford-Stuyvesant. In other words, I spend quite a lot of time with cats, and I can attest to the fact that declawed cats suffer from physical and emotional trauma, resulting in even worse behavior than scratching up your couch. In my experience, declawed cats will result to increased biting and aggression or unwanted marking outside of the litter box as a result. The solution is simple, a $10 cardboard scratching post that you can buy online or in any pet store. Declawing is a brutal practice that actually requires the cat's first toe to be amputated along with the removal of tendons and muscles, leading to a lifetime of pain and discomfort. Cats need their claws. They assist in climbing and maintaining balance. They help to relieve stress through the act of kneading, and they serve to protect a cat from danger. Without their claws and first toes, a cat's gait shifts, creating a strain on the spine and leg joints, which often leads to early arthritis and prolonged back and joint pain. Arthritis has been linked to bone loss and fractures, all to protect a couch or a pair of curtains. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Esther Koslow, and I'm wearing a few hats today. The first is for Shelter Reform Action Committee that's been on the job for 25 years to reform the city's animal shelter system. And we wholeheartedly support Councilman um, Brannon's intro 1478 to create a Department of Animal Welfare. It's something we tried 21 years ago, but we got rebuffed by a court saying that only the mayor could create a government department. But now it's up again. And it's important. Why should the DOH not have any power over animal welfare? Because it has a conflict of interest. Its mission statement is to protect people's health. And animals factor in only if animals pose a risk to the public health. So there you are. So who's going to protect animals? That's why we need an, a Department of Animal Welfare. Um, I would note that um, the animal care and control, animal care centers, are now subsumed and have always been under the Department of Health's pest control division. Animals aren't pests, they need protection. And this bill should be amended, I mean, it should be amended to include all animals. That's not only dogs, cats, bunnies, but all pets, wildlife, and carriage horses. I'm now wearing the hat of a volunteer with um, the Wild Bird Fund, and I'm also a member of the Pigeon Defenders in New York City. And we wholeheartedly support council members Rivera's uh, intro, intro 1201 to stop pigeon netting. Pigeons are wild animals. I've taken many an emergency call by people who have wet, witnessed these pigeon nettings. The animals, the birds, many are injured during the netting, and then they do suffer a terrible fate at the end of this network. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Koslow. Hi, good morning. My name is Heather Greenhouse, and I'm a board member of Voters for Animal Rights. 
Um, I'm here today in support of several bills and resolutions, uh, but would like to talk specifically about Intro 1425, the Carriage Horse Heat Bill, and Reso 379, Meatless Mondays. Um, the Carriage Horse Heat Bill is common sense. Many studies and scientific journals have reported the effects of horses forced to work in extreme temperatures, and all agree that a temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit is too hot. Uh, thus, the horses suffer daily in this cruel industry and even more in severe heat. Changing the regulation to include the real field temperature or heat index would not only make logical sense, but it's simply the right thing to do ethically. Um, in this brutal and antiquated industry where horses suffer day in and day out, forced to work and live in conditions that are the complete opposite of anything natural or enjoyable for their species, I ask you to please support this bill which would allow them one small relief and let them rest when it's too hot outside. Surely we can empathize with these horses and realize that none of us would want to be forced to work outdoors in sweltering heat either. I'd like to also point out that the carriage drivers oppose this bill for one reason only, and that's money. They are only interested in profits. Their business depends on using and abusing animals for profit. If they cared about these animals, they would not force them to work in extreme weather conditions. We have nothing to gain from the horses getting a bit of relief. We are here fighting for this because it's the right thing to do, and we actually care about the horses' well-being. We're on the right side of history. We're on the side of justice. Um, animal exploitation and those who engage in it for profit will be relegated to the dustbin of history and looked back on in shame and horror. Um, about Meatless Mondays, uh, Resolution 379, we are excited to support this initiative pioneered by Helen Rosenthal. Thank you, Helen. Uh, animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change, which is the biggest threat facing our very survival on the planet right now. Um, it's also well known that eliminating meat, dairy, and egg consumption can greatly improve health by reducing the risk of chronic preventable conditions. Furthermore, reducing the suffering of animals by leaving them off of our plates is imperative for a progressive and ethical society. As Helen says, peace begins on your plate. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Hi. My name is Nora Constance Marino. Uh, I'm an attorney in private practice for 20 years. I'm a former JAG officer in the United States Army Reserves, and I'm currently a commissioner on New York City's Taxi and Limousine Commission, although I'm not testifying in uh, that official capacity here today. Um, my law practice focuses mostly on, um, or a great deal of it is on civil rights and constitutional rights. And I mention that because the bills that are presented today are also about rights, and they're about justice. And I'm not going to get into each bill. You're going to hear plenty of very talented speakers here today talk about each particular bill, but um, particularly the carriage horse heat bill, the ban faux gua, which is heinously cruel. There's just no other words for it, to stick a metal pipe down somebody's throat and force food down it for long periods of time. Um, the, the trafficking of birds so they can be shot and used for target practice or, or games or entertainment, the declawing bill, and um, the establishment of Department for Animal Welfare. These bills are all about what is moral and what is just. And this morning on New York One News, Pat Kiernan uh, made a comment. They were talking about this hearing today, and Pat Kiernan made a comment. Uh, why is the council uh, looking at a, a faux gua bill when we have streets that need to be repaired? First of all, the council can look at everything. You can look at bills regarding the streets, you can look at bills regarding people, and you can look at bills regarding animals. You, consider all, you can consider all of them. And frankly, I disagree with Mr. Kiernan because these are the bills that define a city, not the pothole repairs. Bills like this are the bills that define a city and a society and our morality. And this is what makes us progressive, and this is what makes us evolve. Speaking up for the voiceless, speaking up for the vulnerable, this is what defines New York City, and I support all of these bills, and I'm grateful to be a citizen of a city with such a fabulous council that is such a moral compass to initiate these bills, and I am in full support of them, and if you do establish this Department of Animal Welfare, I would like to submit a resume. Thank you. Uh. Thank you for your testimony. Is it, is it Lieutenant? Did I get your rank right? It, it was First Lieutenant, but I'm no longer in the Army. Well, we appreciate your service to the Thank country. You. Thank you very much. And we appreciate your compliment of the City Council and for speaking out today. And we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you to this great panel. And now we will be moving on to our next panel, which includes Matthew...
Matthew Dominguez, Voters for Animal Rights. Cynthia King, Voters for Animal, animal Rights. Eileen Mulvani Newman from Borough President Eric Adams' office. Benjamin Williamson from World Animal Protection. Cynthia Von Schlichten, Compassion in World Farming. Amber Canavan from PETA. Kathy Nazari, Voters for Animal Rights. And Laura Leopardo. Okay, you can start us off, please, so we don't lose time. Thank you very much, council member, members of the committee. Uh, good morning, and this is an incredibly exciting day to be able to testify in support of intro 1378. My name is Matthew Dominguez. I'm a proud Brooklyn resident, voter, and the political advisor for Voters for Animal Rights. Uh, I'll be testifying exclusively on 1378, and I wanna thank the council member, Rivera, for introducing this bill and being a champion for ducks. Uh, the, the photo speaks for itself. Um, I've provided a packet for all the members of the committee. Uh, for those of you who have seen photos of force feeding, for those of you who have seen the videos, this is what the definition of animal cruelty is about. Foie gras is the diseased and enlarged liver of a duck or goose produced through force feeding. The force feeding is done by shoving a metal foot long metal tube down the throat of a bird that is unwilling to have it, who does not want it to have happen, and having food injected that is far more food than it would ever consume on its own. In front of you is this informational packet. This packet details the extraordinary support that Intro 1378 has, which also includes 24 co-sponsors, 23 council members, and the public advocate. On the first page, you're gonna find the table of content, which will help guide you to all the information that we have provided for this committee. And then on the first page, you'll have your fact sheet. <clears throat> the fact sheet will of course detail, <clears throat> excuse me, detail all the information and all the support that this bill has. Page four, a scientific study that was done by Mason Dixon here in New York City that found that 81% of your constituents support this bill, 81%. Uh, page seven, a statement of support by over 50 not-for-profit charities. These are organizations who have a mission to protect our environment, our health, and animals. These are not organizations that are focused on profit and exploiting animals, 50 organizations. Page nine, a letter of support or over 50 New York City and New York State-based veterinary professionals who have endorsed this bill. And page 11 is a statement of support of over 100 New York City-based restaurants that support this ban on foie gras. Additionally, on page 24, uh, you'll find a comprehensive white paper that was done by the Humane Society of the United States that details all the scientific backing for this bill. And on page three, I would call your attention specifically for that, for that uh, document that covers the common myths refuted because the foie gras industry has refused to be candid and transparent when, when it comes to the lies that they're telling. I'll just wrap it up and just say that I'm very proud to be a New Yorker because of, at the end of the day, we fight for, to be a beacon of light for animals. We do not shy away when it comes to abuses. We rather run to aid those who need our help. Our moral character of this city is defined by the way we defend and stand up for the rights of the most vulnerable in our society. And I can't think of a group of living creatures that are more vulnerable and needing of protection than ducks being violently force-fed by the foie gras industry. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amber Canavan. I visited... Is your microphone? My name is Amber Canavan. I visited Hudson Valley Foie Gras in 2011. I did so without permission because I did not believe the misleading advertisements that the company puts out and I thought the public had a right to know the truth. 
I was right to be suspicious. I found that Hudson Valley foie gras is an industrial factory farm that force feeds animals until they become sick and slaughters them just before they would die from the process itself. I discovered that birds were being kept in wire bottom pens suspended over a river of their own waste. The shed was so long and the air so hazy inside that I could barely see the end of it. Just rows after rows of pens filled with distressed birds. When not being used, the force feeding tubes, which were about the length of my forearm, were left dangling menacingly over their heads. Many of the ducks at the facility had difficulty walking and breathing. As experts say that this is because of their engorged livers and being forced to stand 24 seven on the wire. Several of them had dry discharge around their eyes and nostrils. The skin and feathers of many of the ducks were caked with feces and some of the birds suffered from open untreated wounds. I found the corpses of several dead ducks lying beside living birds in these pens. I had hopes that the legal system would do something to help these suffering animals. Instead, after I exposed the truth, Hudson Valley foie gras used its political influence to have me prosecuted and thrown in jail. While being incarcerated is awful, it made me think deeply about the animals used for the foie gras industry all of them who are subjected to far, far worse for their entire lives, only to be killed horribly. I'm extremely grateful to the city council for hearing me out today and considering this issue. Please do not allow Hudson Valley Foie Gras or any other greedy company from the foie gras industry to sell its products in this progressive city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cynthia von Schlichten, and I am speaking to you today on behalf of Compassion and World Farming and our U.S. Executive Director, Rachel Dreskin, who is from Brooklyn, <laughs> and I'm from New York as well. Um, in this capacity, uh, I request the passage of Intro 1378, the proposed ban on the, fail of, on the sale of foie gras. It is not surprising that an organization called Compassion in World Farming would support such a ban as the production of foie gras flies in the face of the very principles that our organization was built upon. Founded by a dairy farmer who became disheartened by the increase in intensive farming more than 50 years ago, we continue his mission on a global scale to end factory farming and its most horrific practices. Foie gras production is certainly one of those practices. It involves the force feeding of ducks or geese via a feeding tube, pipe, or funnel several times a day until they develop fatty liver, which is a painful liver disease. Not only is this process excruciating and results in numerous complications, including bruising, perforation of the esophagus, and asphyxiation, but its production is forcing these birds to live lives that are exclusive to pain, misery, fear, and completely absent of what is natural to them, such as swimming in a pond. Compassion works closely with major food businesses to address supply chain policy changes that reduce animal suffering. A recurring theme in our discussion with food leaders is the significant economic risk an entity faces if they choose to do nothing with regard to animal welfare. So if you need another argument that goes beyond the blatant animal cruelty of foie gras production, take a look at the numbers. More than 70 New York City restaurants already support a ban on force-fed foie gras and 81% of New Yorkers support legislation to prohibit the sale of foie gras. 81%, when was the last time that many people agreed on something? <laughs> Passing intro 1378 is not only banning a practice that is inherently inhumane, but is in the best economic interest of New York City. Thank you. Thank you, I'm just stepping in momentarily for Chair Levine. Uh, hello, my name is Ben Williamson. I'm the US Programs Director with World Animal Protection. Uh, we have offices in over 14 countries. We have an office in Midtown Manhattan, and we operate in over 50 countries. Um, I live on the Upper East Side in Council Member Ben Kalos' district, and myself and my organization support Bill 1378. 
Um, I, I've submitted my written testimony, and it repeats a lot of what my colleagues here have said, so I won't repeat that. I do want to um, answer your question, Councilmember Rivera, from earlier about whether there's any way to produce foie gras humanely, and the answer is simply no. I've been an animal protection professional for eight years now. I've reviewed countless uh, exposés of foie gras farms, including uh, Hudson Valley foie gras, uh, several there, and uh, so-called high welfare farms in France. And even on these, the, so, uh, they're touted as the highest welfare farms in the world. I saw um, footage of birds uh, with broken legs uh, who, whose uh, legs broke under the weight of their own distended livers. I've seen birds uh, who are still not spared the uh, horror of the force feeding machine with those maladies. The ones who can escape, who can run to the side of their open top pens, do so whenever they see the farmer's force feeding machine come round. It tells you what they think about it. Um, they have uh, labored breathing. Their livers are pushed against the side of their lungs. Um, they're panting breathlessly constantly. Um, so there is no such way to produce foie gras humanely. There are, there are some farms in Spain that claim to be humane, but as you know, um, they the birds uh, gorge themselves, but um, tr traditional frog art can only pr be produced through the gavage method of force feeding. Uh, humans would never eat the kind of quantities of food that birds are forced to in ingest from force feeding. Um, so I would just like to say that the EU and the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN all agree um, that there is no way to produce foie gras humanely. Virtually all veterinarians and avian, avian experts agree there is no way to produce foie gras humanely. And uh, I thank you for your time and consideration. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Cynthia King. I live in 39 and own a business in District 40. I am a mother, a teacher, an employer, and a voter. I am here because I was taught, if you see something, say something. I have seen photos, video, and have read the facts about foie gras. You have already heard the gruesome description, so I will skip it here and talk just about what we can do. Councilmember Rivera has introduced a common sense bill that would end the unnecessary suffering by prohibiting the sale of products from force-fed birds in New York City. I strongly support intro 1378. New York City should join dozens of countries, the state of California, and many prominent retailers in prohibiting the sale of foie gras from force-fed birds. What can possibly be a rational argument in favor of this cruel practice and <clears throat> for the record, I also strongly support intro 1425, 1202, 1477, 1496, 1567, resolution 379, 798, and 921. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wonder if one of you could clarify, is, is there such a thing as foie gras that's produced from non-force-fed birds? Um, no, the traditional French method of gavage is the only sanctioned method of producing foie gras. There are farms that claim to produce um, uh, foie gras that doesn't come from force feeding, uh, but that's not foie gras as it's traditionally recognized. That's just pate. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rivera. Thanks again um, for being here. Question, we've covered a lot on the process, the implications, uh, the negative impact. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, I wanna ask you rather about how do you think restaurants could adapt to this proposed law? Well, as, as you mentioned in your opening remarks on this bill, only about one and a half percent of New York City restaurants even provide foie gras on their menu. Most of them, it's just one to two items that are on the men menu, appetizer, something like that. And so for many of the businesses that have this, removing it from it is going to cause no problems for them at all. Um, it is a luxury item. It is not one that many people in New York City eat. Um, I do not believe that this will have any real impact. And I can certainly say there will be absolutely no job loss in New York City. What alternatives to foie gras could the restaurants serve? If 
Of course, uh, there are a few chefs, um, there, are, there are actually quite a few chefs that like Wolfgang Puck and others who have said that they are not gonna contribute to the suffering animals and stopped, stopped using foie gras in their recipes. Um, there are a few out there. There's actually a phenomenal French restaurant in the Lower East Side called Delice and Saracen, where the owner of that restaurant has produced a, an actually very tasty alternative that's a plant-based foie gras. And for many people that, that like the taste of foie gras has gone, have gone in and said that it's, it's relatively passable. And so we would recommend that if they want to keep having something on the menu that resembles it, then to use a plant base. And how much foie gras comes from U.S. production versus other countries? That's a, that's a really great question, and that's one I don't have the answer for, unfortunately. The, the foie gras industry a lot, and industrial farmers, they are not exactly what you would call transparent. Um, we have tried to get information in regards to the number of the ducks at the facilities. We've tried to get numbers in regards to the number of restaurants that serve it, um, how much of it is coming from, say, Hudson Valley into New York City, how many is coming from the foreign countries. Um, we simply don't know. However, the one thing I will say is that we do know that part of foie gras that is coming in, a portion of it that is coming into the city, is coming from the few European countries that still allow the production of it, even though there aren't many. And we do know that investigations have been done in those facilities, and they're equally, if not even more cruel, than the videos that have been taken and the production methods that have been exposed at Hudson Valley. Thank you. Thank you all for, for your advocacy and, and for your answers and for your time. Thank you, thank Chair. You. And I believe Councilmember Holden, you had a question? Thank you. I, I have more of a statement just to thank the panel, this panel, for um, great testimony. And, and Matt, that, is that your name, Matt? Thank you for this, because uh, it's amazing. Uh, and it, I just can't believe we could be so cruel for some a luxury item like Fagua. It's just ridiculous. And um, if you look at these photos, uh, it just makes you so sad that this has to be stopped and it has to be stopped now. I want to thank the panel for your advocacy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Uh, thank you to this panel. We appreciate it. Thank you. Our next panel will include Stephen Malone. Uh, Christina Hansen of Carriage Horses and Drivers. Ah, forgive me. We have um, a few people on the previous panel that did not get to speak. So uh, those of you who did not get to speak, please join us. That was my mistake. Hello? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Eileen Mullaney Newman. I'm here representing Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams. Good morning, Chair Levine and the City Council Committee on Health. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing about prohibiting the sale or offer for sale of foie gras made from force-fed birds. Brooklyn is home to 2.6 million residents, a population that represents the largest county in both New York City and state. The public health of our constituents is therefore one of the most important responsibilities of the Brooklyn Borough President, including not only the physical health of New Yorkers, but also their emotional and well-being mental health. That's why we asked Councilmember Cabrera to introduce Reso 238 to ban processed meats from school food. That's why we work to expand Meatless Monday to all hospitals and schools aided by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal's Meatless Monday resolution. Intro 1378 would prohibit the sale or offer for sale foie gras made from force-fed birds, as well as further provision of such foie gras in any manner in food service establishments, addressing both public health concerns. Foie gras is unhealthy for humans. It derives 85% of its calories from fat and can trigger the production of a certain compound that raises one's risk of developing Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, which is New York's number one killer. And as we all have heard, to produce foie gras, workers force pipes down the throats of confined male ducks and geese two to three times each day. This routine force feeding causes the birds' livers to swell up to 10 times their normal size, which causes difficulty standing, and the birds to tear out their own feathers and attack each other out of stress. 
For humans to inflict this pain upon these animals is emotionally and psychologically damaging. Faux gras has been banned in Austria, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, Germany, India, Israel, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, South Africa, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. Ultimately, there is no justification from a nutritional or humanitarian standpoint for faux gras to be available for sale or consumption in New York City. The Borough President believes that it's our obligation as policymakers to ensure that New York City agencies and institutions do not continue to force feed our health care crisis or perpetuate the suffering of animals. The Borough President stands with the 24 council members who have co-sponsored this historic and important bill that would promote and protect the health of all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And we want to acknowledge what a leader of Borough President Eric Adams has been. Uh, I will relay. On please on on so many issues but but uh, his record on on uh, animal welfare is really extraordinary and I'm very pleased to be his animal advocate okay thank you thank you please thank you counsel for the opportunity to speak today asking you all to support intro 1378 and thank you for this unprecedented number of animal protection bills evidence you are making New York a compassionate city I'm Kathy Nazari, board member of Voters for Animal Rights and Solid Waste Advisory Board, county committee woman in Speaker Johnson's district, and a pet care and behavior specialist. If you live with cats or dogs, you know they have the same emotions we do, including fear. I work with fearful and avoidant pets who have been traumatized by people physically abusing them. PTSD is scientifically documented in animals, most notably military dogs and some farm animals. Foie gras farms meet all the markers for inducing PTSD, which can often result from a single event, and I've provided research for all of you. Please close your eyes and picture yourself in a confined stall surrounded by endless rows of others. A man approaches grabs your face and quickly shoves a long metal pipe down your throat. No anesthesia. It hurts like hell. You try to get away. He pumps 10 pounds of gruel into you and pulls the pipe out. You're in incredible pain and lethargic from all that food. You feel absolutely sick, vomit, there's even some blood. You look down and see a puncture wound on your stomach from where he shoved the pipe too hard. He does the same to your neighbors and leaves. He comes back. Your heart is racing. He repeats what he did earlier. You're in excruciating pain and so sick. When he leaves, a rat climbs on your stomach to pick at your wound. You're absolutely terrified. A couple of hours later, the sadist is back. It's clear there's only one reason he's there. Your anxiety level is incomprehensible, making your throat very dry so that pipe hurts even more. And every day is the same as the first, every single day, day after day, but there's no end until he finally kills you. I don't know a single human being who could withstand this type of prolonged torture. Would you do this to your dog or your cat? Thank you for your time. I urge you all to please support or co-sponsor, if you haven't already, intro 1378 and 1202 to protect birds. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Please. Good morning. My name is Laura Leopardo, and I live in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, in Council Member Lori Combo's district. I urge her to support intro 1378, the force-fed faux gras sales ban. I am here also today to ask your committee to pass that intro. Um, I will repeat several points previously made, but I will read what I have prepared. A few more moments of discomfort or monotony of hearing several facts repeated is nothing compared to the suffering of the birds involved in this cruel and inhumane practice. Birds raised for faux gras spend the first four weeks of their lives eating and growing, sometimes in semi-darkness. For the next four weeks, they are confined to cages and fed a high-protein, high-starch diet that is designated to promote rapid growth. Forest feeding begins when the birds are between 8 and 10 weeks old. Then, for 12 to 21 days, they are subjected to having a pipe unwillingly shoved down their throat 
every day, so between two and four pounds of grain and fat are forced down their throats two to three times per day. The Washington Post reported that tube is, quote, is pushed down their throats and more food that they want is gunned into their stomachs. If the mushy food sticks, then a stick is sometimes used to force it down, end quote. I have even read reports that at times motor oil is used to lubricate the tube for a more easily insertion. The bird's livers, which become engorged, can grow to be more than 10 times the normal size, which is actually a disease called fatty liver disease. So this practice of literally force feeding a bird for the sole purpose of making it sick and diseased just to create some delicacy is gruesome, inhumane, and certainly animal cruelty. The force feeding of ducks and geese caused a host of other afflictions documented by the Scientific Committee on Animal Health and Welfare, which advises the European Commission as well as the American and Canadian Veterinary Medical Associations. These scientists found that birds' biology doesn't protect them from the stress, pain, and injury that occurs from capture and restraint of the birds before the tube's insertion. Um, <clears throat> I move on. So the production of faux gras I is will so ask you to, to, to wrap up quickly yeah. if you can, please. It's so cruel and inhumane that it's been banned in 17 countries. So when you are eating faux gras, you are eating the intentionally diseased liver of a bird that has been inhumanely, ra inhumanely raised and handled. There is nothing ethical about that, and there's no way to make it okay. Just, just to confirm one point you had made, it, it is in fact not true that ducks have no feeling in their throats. They do have this is, I, I, want to, I want to confirm the facts here yes. because there's some misinformation out there. Yes, they, do, they have thicker throats than we do, but they still feel pain because they are sentient beings that feel stress, pain, and love and actually avoid the workers that come to them to insert those pipes because they know what, what is coming next. Okay, that, that's a critical point. I just wanted to get that out there. I have a question for you, which maybe some members of the first half of the panel might be able to help with. Mm -hmm. But is it true that there is experimentation now to create in the laboratory lab-grown foie gras? Do we know about this? Mm -hmm. I cannot answer that question. Okay. Not that um, I'm aware of. Yeah, if you, you could come back, sure. Uh, there is a growing movement, um, whether it's meat producers or from animal advocacy groups and other uh, corporations, to make sure that animals are not killed and animals are not tortured for meat, dairy, and eggs. And in vitro meat and other um, cell-based clean meat is being produced. However, the companies that are working on this, uh, are, I, from my understanding, are not working on foie gras. It is such a niche product that in order to put the amount of money that it would require to create that into something that very very few people consume is just not business sense. Uh, most of those companies are focusing on making burgers and hot dogs and chicken. Thank you for that clarification and thank you to this panel. We appreciate you speaking. Now we can move on to uh, Stephen Malone from Horse Carriages, Christina Hansen, also uh, Carriage Horses and Drivers, uh, as well as Josh Salsville. Ariel Fency, uh, Allison Quarrel, and we have Lily Hodge from the uh, Equine Cultural Heritage Museum. And you can, you can start us out. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Malone. I'm a second generation carriage owner operator, and my family's been in this business since 1967. I come to you today to vehemently oppose intro uh, 1425. During the past summer of 2018, the hottest summer the carriage industry has ever had to endure, we did so with zero, I repeat, zero incident. The current regulation has been on the books for 30 plus years and is a strong and fair regulation. The regulation quite simply works. With this regulations, our horses have been through 30 summers without incident and I am confident it would continue another 30 if the regulation was left as is. There is no basis for this change other than the city with the help of New York Class to try to overregulate us out of business. I have personally met with most of you over the last few months in regard to this bill and have offered many very good solutions, solutions that are reasonable, solutions that are rational and make perfect sense to better protect our horses. 
unlike other industries, we come to you without an open hand or a handout. We don't come with you with gripes and complaints. We come to you with solutions, solutions to created public problems that do not exist. We are a self-sufficient industry that is completely dependent on the weather. We need to protect our strong and fair regulations on the books now rather than arbitrarily changing laws that work and do not need to be changed. Passing intro 1425 will create a major hardship for all the men and women within the, that operate within this industry. Arbitrarily changing the industry to an index will not protect the horses any better than it does now, but actually will make it worse on them. Under the new law, they will not get the proper exercise for most parts of the summer, and the horses will not even be allowed out uh, most days when the humidity is very high in the morning. At least today, the horses can get their exercise until the temperature reaches the legal limit of 90 degrees before returning to the stable. I will wrap up. This bill as written today is not only careless but irresponsible on behalf of the City Council. There have been no studies done to warrant such a major change to the current legislation to show better protection for our horses. Intro 1425 on the surface looks like a good reasonable bill to most, but if the bill is enacted, it will be d do the exact opposite of what it is enacted to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Malone and Christina. Could you turn your mic on? Okay, all right, it's on now, and I'm losing my voice, but uh, members of the Committee on House, Council Members, and Chairman Levine, who is my council member. Uh, my name is Christina Hansen. I've been a carriage driver for 13 years, seven in New York City, and I come here with numbers. For the past 30 years, our heat regulations have worked perfectly to protect carriage horses. There are very few laws you can say that of. Our horses have never worked above 90 degrees, the temperature measure where they work with they return to their stables. Extremely hot summers like last year's where we suspended 34 days meant that our horses actually worked less last summer than they usually do. This bill if enacted, would have added 16 to 20 more days of suspensions that neither our horses nor we can afford to miss. Um, we're proud to already have the lowest stop work temperature in the country. I used to drive in Philadelphia where our horses were suspended at 92 without incident. Carriage horses in Charleston and Savannah that use heat index values stop work at 95 absolute temperature or 110 degree heat index quite safely. Chicago City Council in 2017 reviewed their stop work temperature, also 90 Fahrenheit, and veterinaries from the Illinois State Veterinary Medical Association determined that 90 Fahrenheit was a perfectly adequate temperature cutoff since carriage horses are doing extremely light work, usually at a walk. I have included those documents from Illinois. Uh, and they rejected lowering the temperature there. Carriage horses are no different physiologically from police horses, race horses, and riding horses, yet none of these other equine populations in New York City would be subject to this ridiculous restriction. The ASPCA even sponsors an event out in Long Island in August, the Hampton Classic, where horses routinely compete in much warmer weather. Intro 1425 is the product of New Yorkers for Clean, Livable, and Safe Streets. This organization has, since 2008, existed solely for the purpose of putting us out of business, whether by replacing our horses with electric loppies, cutting the number of licensed horses and our revenue in half, moving carriages off of their hack stands on Central Park South and hiding them in the park, or this new scheme to limit our ability to pay our bills during the summer months and take care of our horses. Um, since we last testified before the City Council on Carriage Horse Legislation at, in January of 2016, that class has spent more than a half a million dollars lobbying everyone in this City Council uh, for changing our already effective and humane regulations. There is zero evidence this bill would help horses in any way, says they are already being perfectly protected by the 90 Fahrenheit cutoff. Please support science, horses, and carriage workers and vote no on 1425. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. I just want to pause and say we've had a remarkably respectful hearing so far. I want to thank everybody for that and want to continue in that vein for the rest of the hearing. Please proceed. Hello, my name's Alison Clark. I'm the Southeast Vice President of the New York State Horse Council, which is New York State's umbrella organization for horses. Amongst other committees, we have a humane, humane committee and a safety committee. Um, because I've been told I can only read one testimony, and I have several expert ones, I would like to read, please, uh, the testimony of Dr. Harry Werner, veterinary doctor, and he is in opposition to intro 1425, as are the New York State Horse Council. His testimony reads, my name is Harry Werner. 
I have practiced equine medicine and surgery in Connecticut and New York State for 45 years and am past president of the American Association of Equine Practitioners. I have personally visited each of the Central Park carriage horse stables and inspected the horses. In my opinion, these horses get exceptionally good care and this extends fully to their working conditions. There is absolutely no evidence-based data to support any lowering from 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature at which their work must be suspended. There is simply no equine benefit to be achieved by doing so. The current protocol is working well and is in the best interest of the horse's health and welfare. I strongly advise against this proposed change, respectfully. Thank you. And uh, I, I'll inform you that you're free to submit the testimony from the other experts to the sergeant. And for any folks here in public who are not able to speak, uh, they also may submit their testimony to the sergeant and it is entered into the record. Thank you. My name is Lily Hodge and I'm not a horse expert, but I was asked to read this statement from Gloria Austin, who is an educator, an internationally renowned carriage driver um, who took a carriage ride in Central Park on Sunday. Uh, she's located in Florida, so she's not here. Uh, as a carriage driving expert, I believe there is no further need for regulating the work of horses in New York City. Horses have been bred for 6,000 years to serve mankind for trans transportation, agriculture, warfare, and commerce. We have only used self-propelled vehicles for 100 years. These people who make their living with horses do not want to abuse their horses, nor work them beyond their limits, or they lose their livelihood. Our history must be preserved through the presence of horses on the streets of New York. Please, no further regulation, and I praise you for keeping these important symbols of our history on the streets of New York. Thank you. My name is Joshua Sawsville. I'm a carriage driver. And uh, I mean, I think anyone who is involved knows that the current regulation is fine. It's actually very strict. 90, as the temperature gets taken by the NYPD using an official thermometer on the sidewalk at the horse carriage line, it's very organized and we get suspended a lot already because it is quite strict as it is. To arbitrarily say that it has to be 90 heat index and keep it at that number just because 90 is kind of a nice round number, well, it's just plain silly, but it's also uninformed. Uh, but I think there's kind of an unspoken assumption that is the only reason that NY class and the anti-horse carriage lobby gets taken seriously. And it has a lot to do with the fact that our industry is mostly made up of an immigrant workforce. And the assumption is that only Americans know how to treat animals. Only rich Upper East Side New Yorkers know how to treat animals. Only white people know how to treat animals. And that that assumption is coloring this whole debate, and it's, it's very unfair to my industry that we have to put up with this, uh, frankly, unspoken racism that we have suffered with for years coming from the animal rights lobby. Thank you. You know, you're free, you're free to cite statistics but don't impugn the motives of people on the other side. Uh, and don't, don't ascribe. It's okay, I appreciate it. Don't ascribe that form of prejudice. Uh, it's really uh, inappropriate and inaccurate. Um, do we have one more person who is scheduled for this panel? Is that right? Ariel. What? You called my name before. You called my name, Ariel Finsey. Uh, yes, your name again, sir? Ariel Finsey. Okay, could maybe one of your colleagues swap out a seat? <laughs> my name is Ariel Finsey. I'm a carriage driver since 1981. I'm around horses since 1958. 
I grew up with horses, I love horses, I love people, and um, I'm here to speak on behalf of everybody, but especially from the horse's mouth, the horse's feeling, and the horse's needs. The horse's needs, in order to be in a good shape, they must have a knife exercise daily. It makes them, all the gut system, it makes them function very, adjust to it, be adjusted and function very well. To keep the horses, and, and for anybody to decide it, that they cannot work with the new current laws that you're suggesting, it would hurt our horses. That's not something you want to do. We need to take our time to do a thoroughly investigation and thoroughly study and make sure that what your intention is to protect our horses would not hurt our horses. It's not your intention. You must use a horse sense and a horse needs is to be on the first priority. It's not about the money. I heard about here, it's all money, money. No, it's not about the money. We care and love our horses. We have a full commitment to our horses. Please, take your time. Don't rush to make something that would hurt everybody. I pledge you. Thank you. I believe Councilmember Powers has. Yeah, I have a few questions. Thank you. I, I just want to start, though, just to reject the premise here that was stated that this is about anti immigrant or anti worker. If, if you believe that the New York City Council is against immigrants or workers, you just simply haven't been paying attention to the work that the Council has been doing. And, and predominantly for an industry, I'm, not, I'm one of the five members of the Irish caucus, an industry that's been historically Irish and immigrant. It's, I, re, I just want to reject that out of, out of hand. And I, I've been, never vilified the industry. I've never, I've been, I've been careful to hear the concerns and to be careful in hearing what, um, how the impact of the industry would be. And, and, I, and I don't feel like that respect is being given back to the, the council today, to be, to be fair. But I'm gonna ask questions anyway. Um, I, the, so my first question is the administration was here and they made a recommendation to us about using a different index. I understand, you've, I understand the position of the panel is that 90 degrees as stated today is a, is a fine metric, but I'm interested in hearing thoughts on the administration's recommendation today about using the equine heat index rather than the uh, national weather index, national weather heat index. Well, I, I you know, Again, as long as it's good for the horses, we're definitely definitely open to discussion. Uh, I, I think there needs to be studies done, and I think there needs to be a, a panel of, of non-biased veterinarians brought in to, to weigh in on this subject more than there has been so far. Uh, I do not believe we would be completely against it, but we're definitely open for the discussion. And I think, you know, we have the Rental Horse Advisory Board that was in place for many years that maybe that's something that they could weigh in on as well. Got it. I, I actually have testimony from the past chairman of the Rental, uh, Rental Horse Advisory Board, but I have to submit it because I cannot read it to you, I think. Okay, you can submit it to us, and we'll take a look at it. So, I mean, presumably you do believe, though, there is a number here that it were, where an animal or a horse particularly shouldn't be out and working. And, and so I'm curious to hear what that number is. Well, um, the thing is, is that our number that we have right now is already sufficient. It is very low. It's basically, it has protected our horses perfectly. So whatever that number is, is actually higher than what we're at now. Um, and that number would be the same number that it would be for the police horses, the race horses at Aqueduct, the red riding horses, the therapeutic horses, and all of the horses in New York City uh, who are subject to this climate and this particular geography. Obviously, horses in other parts of the country work quite safely to much higher temperatures because they're acclimated to the subtropical temperatures of Florida or whatever. So um, that the point is, is that this particular number of 90 is, it works perfectly. And so whatever that number is, it's much higher than what we're at now. I want to add something else. That our horses is part of the whole trade carriages around the country. 
So think what, how, why our horses should be singled first. Second, our horses, if they are not comfortable, they let us know. Even if it's 80 degrees, I would take my horse out if it's not comfortable. But the, as of now, in general speaking, we are f falling, we are going and, and go behind the horse and we see what the horse needs and we follow the horses. The horses are the leaders for us. Can I just ask a question? I, I, I'm just, I mean, whether, how many, were there any horse deaths last year? Not from no. heat. There's not been any heat deaths since. How, how about it? How about in so, to, just in total? In, in, in terms of what? Last year. In, in terms, terms of, of the horse deaths. I mean, we're talking about well, working of, conditions. Well, yeah. Well, obviously, horses die, but there's nothing that has been to say that they died due to working in this industry. I and understand. Our horses are how many? How many was for 2018? For 2018? I, uh, how many died? I have no idea. The Department of Health. Certainly none at work. Deaths. Not at work. None at work. No, zero. No, no. Zero. Zero on the job. How many? Do you have a? Okay. So moving on. So how many days do you estimate, if we change under the current metric, would be would take carriages off the streets? Well, judging from what we had last year, and I think with this new regulation, if it's brought in as it's brought in written today, it would make last year the norm, and it was being. In, well, we were suspended for 34 days, and I believe it was another 16 days on top of that. That would have been. How many days were for the 90 degree temperature? 34. 34, 34 last year? Mm -hmm. Yes. Were for a period of time, not the entire day. Not the entire day, but this particular heat index, which we're. we're using the National Weather Service's readings for Central Park, which may not be exactly what they are at the Hack Lines. It probably would be warmer at the Hack Lines than it is at the Belvedere Castle. That's what we generally find is that before we've changed our hacks, we also changed our hack stand locations since last summer. And it's so far we've been sent in at lower temperatures this year relative to the Central Park National Weather Service thing than before. So uh, we're already going to be losing more work because of that, because our carriage stand on 6th Avenue no longer has any shade um, because of that move. So, um, but what we looked at based on the National Weather Service data and the data that we had from the hack stands, we missed 34 partial days last year. 90 heat index would have sent us in another 16 to 20 days, as Steve mentioned. And for a lot of those 34 days that we missed, uh, where we were suspended around 12, 15, 1 o'clock, we would not have been able to leave the stable at 9.30 in the morning on the weekdays when we were allowed to leave to go to work because it is more humid in the morning than it is throughout the day. So we might have been, it might have been 84 degrees at 9, 9.30, but the humidity was such that we wouldn't be able to leave. But at 4 o'clock, it might have been 86 and a lower humidity, and we might might have been able to go back out again, depending on what was going on in the, in the hack stands and everything like that. So this, you know, 50 days of full or partial um, suspension is a lot. Um, and it's not healthy for the horses, especially on those days where you might have a heat wave. Now, bearing in mind that a heat wave, we're not, the horses aren't out when it, you know, once it hits 90, they go in. So it doesn't matter whether it's going to be 93 or 98 or how humid. The minute it turns 90, they stop working. The temperature that they work at has never changed in the past 30 years. So, you know, there might be a really hot time where we can at least take the horses out and take care of them and get them the exercise that they need for their digestive systems to function, for their well-being and everything like that. Uh, we could at least get them out for an hour or two in the morning. And this bill would eliminate that during one of these hot and humid heat waves like we had last year. So it's, it's not... We understand the intention, you know, by the the city council of, of doing this, you know, to take into account humidity, but, you know, it, it's not actually helping the horses when they're already protected perfectly from heat stress. To the, to the, and I'll just wrap my questions up, but to the point that the administration made, and I don't know much about that index, so mm -hmm. I'm just taking their information here, they're matching to what our current standards that are used in other, like the polo industry and other industries they cited, which I, in your testimony I note, you said that, we, that other industries are, we're not 
they're not talking about other other right. uses and other industries. So I, I heard Mr. Malone's point. Does that mean you're also supportive of the administration's point to match it to a measurement tool that's used in other areas? Uh, certainly. I mean, I you know the, the reality is is that um, um, we already have more restrictive. Uh, temperature requirements than pretty much any other equine discipline or industry. So, um, you know, the, the answer is, is like they did a big study for the 1996 uh, Summer Olympics in, um, in Atlanta because it's very hot and humid there. And there were all kinds of recommendations that were made. And then all of those things were nowhere near a 90 heat index. They were significantly warmer horses or outdoor animals. So. I think you know that it's important to take a look at you know like what the mounting unit is doing, what the aqueduct's doing, what the riding horses and therapeutic uh, horses are doing, and, and the reality is is that they, they don't have the regulations that we do. Um, but we do know that horses are able to be outside because they're outdoor animals, walking at a very low level of exertion, which is what carriage horses do, without ill effect. They sweat to keep cool. They're well hydrated thanks to our water troughs. Uh, so we certainly are open to the health department bringing in, um, you know, equine veterinarians to look at the issue and to make some recommendations as to humidity as well. But I think we're nowhere near it with, with the current uh, proposal. Okay. I'm going to wrap my questions up there because I know we have a, a long uh, hearing head. I I just want to say again, I'm I'm happy to hear more information from folks, but 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 launching into attacks on people's intentions here, who are who are supportive of animal rights or council members, is a bad way to start a conversation or should have a conversation at a point where we're trying to have a reasonable conversation about what we think is right for animals and how to protect workers and protect the industry. And I'm not saying everybody's guilty of that, but we certainly, when you come here, there's a reasonable expectation that we can act like adults and we can have a conversation back and forth and not attack each other. And I will not be attacking anybody for any position they take on this, and I would ask the same from everybody in this room today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. I'd like to associate myself with those remarks, and I thank this panel. We're going to move on now to Sean Brooks of Prestige Towing. Uh, Miguel Montiel from, I think it's Corona Self-Help Center. Andy Wertheim from D'Artagnan. Nelson Saravia from LaBelle Farms. Jo Jocelyn Huno from R Rugy. And Daniela Mercado from La Belle. And you can kick us off, sir, while everyone's getting settled. Hello? I'm on. I think you're on, yes. Yes, sir. Please. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Sean Brooks. Um, I own Prestige Towing and Truck Repair in Harris, New York, and um, Hudson Valley Fagwa, as well as uh, La Bella Farms, uh, have been my customer uh, and friends of mine for many, many years. Um, I'm here in opposition to 1378. Um, together, these two farms contribute well over a quarter million dollars uh, a year in business uh, to, my, to my company. We currently employ over 60 people in Sullivan County servicing these farms and, and, and other customers in upstate New York. Um, we frequent New York City ourselves. Um, we're here on a regular basis. We eat in your restaurants. We shop in your stores. Um, we serve hundreds of people that work on these farms. They're, they're our customers also. Um, they frequent our area and spend money as well. Um, these two farms are a huge economic staple in the Sullivan County area, um, and uh, a huge amount of business is generated by these farms. 
I'm proud to do business with these farms. Um, I have never seen uh, any, um, um, anything that would offend me. Um, I think that uh, most everybody um, that I do business with at these farms are uh, animal uh, friendly people. Um, I'd be shocked if somebody showed me something uh, different. Um, the proposed legislation would be detrimental to uh, these farms, our employees, um, and many, many more. Um, I've been in business for about 26 years myself. Um, I've always been taught, you know, supply, demand, supply, demand. Um, if these people have a demand for their product, they must be doing a good job producing it. Um, I think that, um, I think we live in a time, uh, can I finish? If you can briefly I, wrap up, please. Okay, long story short, si uh, simply put, um, we all rely on these folks. Um, I disagree uh, with the current legislation, you know, the current uh, bill that you're proposing, uh, and it would be extremely detrimental to many, many, many people that I think you should consider. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Hello, members of the Health Committee. My name is Nelson Saravi Jr. I'm a second generation farmer employed by LaBelle Farms and the son of Nelson Saravi Sr., co founder and one of the owners of LaBelle Farms. I'm here in opposition of instruction 1378. I haven't been I have been involved with the farm from a young age of twelve. Being a farmer is more than just a job, but a lifestyle that we take very seriously, which can be hard for people to under, who are not farmers to understand. We work long days of hard and intensive labor, and it's a profession that requires a lot of sacrifice, patience, and discipline that is only obtained with years of experience. Though on the hard and long days we may ask ourselves why we chose this work, there are a few things in life that can give us the same feeling of honor and pride that comes with being a farmer. We are pr proud of the work that we do and the animals we care for day in and day out. The ducks are not only our livelihoods, but our lives, and we take care of them. Along with this, being part of this operation has given me and so many others a, su a support system that can only be explained by telling my story. In 2011, I was injured playing football at the college I was attending. I had to have surgery on my right knee, and I found myself addicted to the painkillers and started on a path of self-destruction. For anyone that's ever loved or cared for anyone that's an addict, they know the amount of damage their addiction can cause. For years, I would carry on like this, but never did the family and friends that I worked with over at LaBelle Farms pull their support for me. In 2014, I finally hit rock bottom and nearly homeless and deep in debt, my family and friends pulled me aside for an intervention. I realized I needed help, but I was unable to afford any kind of rehab. LaBelle Farms paid for me to go to rehab for three months, and today I stand in front of you five years sober. I was able to rebuild my life they paid for me to get my commercial driver's license so I can get a pay raise. With that pay raise, it allowed me to pay for my wedding, buy my first home, and support my new family that I just welcomed a newborn baby on January 4th of this year. This support, the support of this, the point is, this company helps me and so many others, and while I understand some people have concerns with the treatment of the ducks, I can assure you that that any mistreatment of ducks, oh, I, lost. I can show you that if the mistreatment of ducks was part of our jobs, none of us would be here and our farm would be out of business. I urge you to look at the facts while you consider this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Saravia, and for sharing your, uh, your compelling personal story. Uh, I think we can all agree whatever we feel about the, the welfare of the ducks, that uh, to hear about your success in, in achieving sobriety and other um, breakthroughs uh, over the challenges that you've confronted is, is certainly uh, a wonderful story, uh, yeah. and we appreciate you sharing right. it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Andy Wertheim, and I am president of D'Artagnan Foods. We're a 35-year-old company in Hudson Valley's biggest supplier, uh, biggest distributor of foie gras in New York. We employ 280 people uh, in our company, and this ban would have repercussions to our company that we might not be able to recover from. Uh, first, I'd like you to know that I'm not a foie sycophant. I've 
devoted my career to doing better for you foods in the areas of diabetes, dysphagia, um, a bunch of areas, and I joined D'Artagnan specifically 13 years ago because of their values. D'Artagnan is not just a purveyor of meats, uh, but also a company whose reputation, point of difference, and very reason for being is predicated upon superior animal husbandry and a commitment to always seeking the highest possible standards regardless of cost and difficulty. We're the anti-factory farm company, for those of you who would like to look us up. If you were to visit our facility, we raise chickens, ducks, and geese as pets. Our owner, who could not be here today, grew up on a farm, and uh, I would say personally, she loves, more, she loves animals more than any person that I've ever met. We, we get just as sickened about animal cruelty and inhumane farming practices as this committee. Our rigid specifications and principles are our calling card. We only hire people who share these core values. Hudson, Hudson's commitment to good animal husbandry uh, is beyond reproach. If it wasn't, I guarantee you our company would not be doing business with them. We applaud this council's push for more humanity and decency and uh, the work of the Humane Society while um, the distortions today, uh, the misinformation, um, I would welcome a civilized discussion with everybody because the distortions of information today are, are, are grand. But we share core values with them and we don't view them as anathema. Surely there's room for incremental, incrementality in the world of farming and processing, and I'm proud to represent a company that, that does that. We want to fight alongside you, not as, uh, not as adversaries. We periodically ask our uh, customers to come up to the farm. We are transparent. We want to demonstrate the reality versus the hyperbole. So too many lives depend upon you not rushing to judgment today. And if you act without visiting the farm, you will not only deprive New York City of the scene of great product, but you will effectively cripple hundreds of disciples of the very mission that you seek to energize. Thank you. Thank you. To most, when I... No, no, no applauding, please. To most, when I say that I am the youngest of four, they may think, wow, that's a lot of kids. But nothing out of Could you maybe uh, pull the microphone a little bit closer so we can hear you? Would you like me to restart? Sure. To most, when I say that I'm the youngest of four, <clears throat> they may think, wow, that's a lot of kids, but nothing out of the normal. When I say that I'm a 19-year-old girl currently enrolled in a private college, they still may think it is normal. However, when I say that I am Mexican and that I'm going to be following the footsteps of all three of my siblings by graduating college, it is not normal, but rather it is a dream come true a dream that both of my parents imagined when they came to the United States of America. My name is Daniela Mercado, and I'm the proud daughter of immigrants. From 1996 through 2005, my father worked for Hudson Valley Foy Grass. From 2005 to now, my father works for LaBelle Farm. In those 23 years of labor, my father has been able to give my siblings and I everything. Our whole lives have been filled with opportunities that I know my parents did not have themselves. I can remember from a very young age they taught my siblings and I the importance and value of education. With my parents' help, I was able to participate in cross-country, indoor and outdoor track, debate club, and national honor society during my high school years. In the end, I graduated in the top 10 of my class as number five with an advanced regents diploma. I also made it to the cross-country states championship meet in 2017, all because of, my, of the many times my dad drove me to and picked me up from practice. My parents just simply want the very best for us. And now my eldest brother and sister graduated college in 2016, while my other brother graduated from the same college in 2017. Since then, my eldest brother has been in South Korea for the last two years following his dream of teaching English. My sister has become a lead microbiologist in a research lab with my other brother following suit, while I have just recently finished my freshman year of college. Uh, when I was applying for college, I specifically remember my father telling me not to worry about the cost, but to worry about finding a school that best suits me and the career that I plan to follow, because I knew that my parents would work endlessly, no matter what, to make sure that I was able to study to make a better future for myself. And to conclude, um, it is because of my father's labor and my mother's support that my siblings and I have the lives to one day be able to provide our own children with better futures. And I ask that before you make your decision, 
please take into consideration the jobs and livelihoods outside of New York City that will be affected by your choice. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Miguel Montiel, and I'm representing the Corona Health Care Center. And I thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak in this hearing. I'm here because I think uh, it is very important to, to speak about the human part. Uh, it should know that the foie gras producers are humane with their workforce, extremely. They are unique in their engagement in the communities, particularly when it comes down <clears throat> to their workforce, not just uh, to enhance productivity or distribution, but also because they care. So um, they make sure that their workers have access to good housing, their workers can attend their families, and also when they need to have access to services related to mental health as it is with the substance abuse recovery in the area of Hudson Valley. In that, they are unique. A few years ago, while working in the field of substance abuse, I encountered uh, Hudson Valley for Grand Label Farms. The farms were eager to bring our services to serve those in need. At the time, they got involved because they knew that addiction afflicts men in New York and because they felt that culturally competent and free services should be supported. Today, I can tell you that our organization, without the support of these farmers, wouldn't be the same. They support our members with their contributions, with a place for them to work and be independent. They support us with housing for our members so they can trans, uh, transition from using drugs to productive life. And they help us understanding that the approach to recovery should be holistic. Therefore, they have donated sports equipment, work with us, uh, helping us uh, to create a unique place in Sullivan County that can benefit anyone desiring a different life. With all due respect, I urge you to let the idea go that those benefit by production of foie gras are a few, and to understand that, that there are a lot of communities in the Hudson Valley and even in New York City that depend on these farms. Those that believe foie gras should be banned lack the understanding that communities affected by this ban will never recover. Finally, I thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and I hope uh, that you might reconsider on this proposal and allow the farm to continue working with us. Thank you very much. Please, sir. Yes. I'm Jocelyn Honou from uh, Rouget. I'm representing Rouget, one of the largest producers of foie gras in, uh, in, uh, in the world. And uh, just to tell you, I'm not going to go through the, to the testimony over here. I'm just going to tell you my personal story about, about foie gras. So I've been in the industry for 20 years, and I work for an, uh, in, a, in a restaurant and uh, doing, doing anything that you could, you could imagine. After that, I, bo I moved to the distribution. And after that, I started to, uh, to consider to come to the foie gras industry, but I had my doubts. Me, as an animal lover, I have an animal at home. I have my, my, uh, my reticence about this. I went to Rouget, based in Canada, and I, went, I started my, um, my internship with them to see how it is. And I was very amazed about the way that they treat all the, thing, all the dogs. That the conception that you have over here today, that I have seen over here, is not the right conception of about foie gras. To be able to have foie gras, you have to have care about the dogs. You have to be able to say that the, the foie gras name usually is a liver. So the liver, to be able to have a liver, to have that as a dish, as, a, as, a, as something that you could eat, you have to treat the animal very well. You have to make sure that there are no stress. You have to make sure that when it's, uh, in the summer, when it's a lot of uh, heat outside, they have uh, AC inside. In the winter, when it's cold, they have heat. As uh, you could treat them as a, as a human being, always, to be able to have the right response to it. So my decision to come to, uh, to work for a foie gras company is not based on the, on the either I like, I like, uh, I like uh, the industry or not, it's based on my, my, uh, my personal idea about the foie gras, and I was like, wow, I was very amazed about that, uh, that industry. And if any other company that treat animals the right way, and they could do it, that could be on a foie gras business. Okay, is there someone else who's on this panel who we need to swap in? Do we get everybody already? Um, I wonder if someone who knows uh, the business structure at either LaBelle or Hudson Valley can explain whether there are other products that you produce beyond foie gras? 
and what portion of your business that constitutes? So I can tell you from D'Artagnan's standpoint, about 18% of our business is foie gras, from the foie gras duck. But more importantly, um, we represent, because we do a couple of other um, uh, artisanally uh, uh, farmed products, such as a vegetable-fed chicken um, at uh, Hudson. So uh, the implications to us being hit by this foie gras initiative go well beyond the loss, which would be catastrophic in and of itself, because the very nature of what we do, what my company does, is based upon small farms, is based upon antibiotic-free, all the methods that are anti-commercial. So when we operate, we are not going to be able to go to other farms. You get rid of a, a Labella or a Hudson Farms, what you have then is the destruction of the small farm structure in this, in this uh, country, and then we're left eating um, factory farmed items. And that's uh, just meant to make it as cheap as possible. So uh, we, we'll let uh, Hudson speak to that, but we're probably 35 to 40 percent of their business. So it affects beyond just the foie gras band. And what percent of the foie gras sales are to New York City? Of our foie gras sales are to New York City, probably 35, 40 percent. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm doing my math right, uh, this is uh, in the single digit as a percent of your total business. And no, I hear we, you on we do about, uh, I would say we do about uh, tw uh, Well, you said 18 percent. Fifteen million dollars worth of uh, foie gras duck business in New York City. Okay, in you the said, five boroughs. Right. You said 18 percent overall foie gras, and then 35 to 40 percent of that is in New York City. Uh, I understand that's not a trivial amount, but and and we certainly uh, respect all the workers who have come here to speak out, and we very much care about your perspective. Um, this is a society whose values are evolving where we're becoming ever more conscious about ethical treatment of animals and we want businesses to adapt to that and that in this case could mean um, growing your business in some of the other product lines sir we've could, been doing we've been doing that okay. for a long time what i all we ask is for a civilized discussion not uh, these numbers that are being thrown around here that are just they're ridiculous in terms of their context. So all we ask is for a civilized discussion so the facts truly can come out. Um, we, we share your values, okay? But we want a chance to exchange a free flow of ideas on those values. Well, you've heard nothing but civility from, from me and my colleagues today, I think it's fair to say, and, and that will continue to be the case. Thank you. Um, and, and we certainly always value dialogue at all times. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilmember Rivera. Quick, quick questions for the farmers, and thank you all for being here and for giving the, the, your time and for sharing your personal stories. I'm excited for you to go to college. So how many ducks do you have on your farm at a single time? Turn the mic on. We have uh, speakers that will come up that will give you all the right answers for that. Okay. Right. So you, there's no estimate, no numbers, or someone else is going to speak? Someone else is going to speak. Okay. Right. Well, um, I really wanted to ask questions about kind of applying the ethical standards given the production. So I will wait to ask that question. So I guess thank you all again for being here. Councilmember Rosenthal, did you have a question? Okay. One moment, uh, folks, one moment, we do have yeah, additional questions. Yeah, it's not really so much for the workers, um, but I do have just a few questions um, for the farm, uh, right, for the representative of, um, thank you, sorry, someone gave it away, uh, for, yeah, for Andy um, Wertheim, thank you. You know, I've actually thought about this for a very long time because a friend of mine um, is a chef and has visited the farm. And he reported that uh, um, he was comfortable with the procedure that went on. 
But of course, he's in a conflicted position because he sells the product. My concern is that while it is, and I just want to get very specific, and I want to hear your very specific response, while it is normal for a, a duck to swallow a fish whole, right? And that's, that's the response I'm always getting. We're not shoving something down a throat because it is normal for a duck to swallow a fish whole. Help me understand the difference between a fish, which is squishable and can move, and a steel rod. For the most part, I'd like to defer to a veterinarian who's going to be speaking on that account um, from Hudson Valley. But what I would say to you is, uh, without, a, without a gag reflex, um, the, the, the people, respectfully, who start talking to how would you like to be a human with somebody shoving a pipe down your throat, it's, 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 it's a non-starter. So we're, we're not ducks, okay? We're not, I, we're not I'm, pigeons. I'm not, so I, I, would, I asked you I would like uh, respectfully if you could just look in my eyes mm -hmm. and answer my question. What I would say is I, I can speak to the business angle and what I would like and to tell you that we're, for my company, we are dedicated to um, non-factory farming. That is our whole mission, is to be non-factory farming. So when Again, we, when we got I'm, I'm really asking, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm really just asking a very simple question. Um, um, an animal regulates its intake of food, right? When it's hungry, and I'm gonna guess, it can find a fish and swallow the fish whole. So I understand the idea that something going down the throat whole is reasonable. I'm trying to understand the difference between a fish and a pipe and uh, an amount of food that is um, in nature normal, a whole fish, and uh, not in nature, uh, an overextension of of the belly or of the liver. Yeah, the morphology of, of the duck will have to be spoken to by a uh, veterinarian. Okay. But I will say they do that on their own naturally. But they do, do not what? have on a their gavage. Own. They go through the gavage process and swallow on their own naturally um, heavy amounts to last them. Um, okay, you so. know what? I think let's stick with the vet. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, and thank you to this panel. Next up, we'll be hearing from Jessica Hollander, Michael Dowling from the Tamerlane Sanctuary, Kristen Kuhi from V for Veganism, Isabel Angel, Linda Morin, and Christina Liu. Okay, please. Hi, my name is Jessica Hollander and I am a Brooklyn resident and business owner. And I strongly support the bill to ban foie gras, intro 1425, and any law that improves the lives of non-human animals at the hands of human animals. But I'm gonna use my time today to read a letter from Holly Cheever, who is a doctor of veterinary medicine and the vice president of the New York State Humane Association. Dear New York City Council Health Committee, I am an equine veterinarian educated at Harvard University and at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell with a lifetime of experience in horse management, including driving carriage horses. 
I have practiced veterinary medicine in the state of New York for the past 40 years, and I have served as a consultant to many animal advocacy groups to eliminate New York's anachronistic and inhumane carriage horse tourist trade. As I have stated consistently since my first involvement with this industry in 1988, I do not believe that New York City can provide a safe and humane environment for its carriage horses for myriad reasons, and I live to celebrate someday the news that the industry has folded. That said, until the horses are removed from this inappropriate environment, I support Intro 1425. As long as the industry exists in New York City and horses are forced to pull carriages during extreme heat and humidity, Intro 1425 would be better for them than leaving the inadequate temperature laws as they currently are. Changing the law so that horses must stop working when the heat index reaches 90 or above would provide some relief for the horses who currently only stop working when the air temperature hits 90 degrees and more, and they often work when the heat index far surpasses 90 degrees. Our high humidity levels add to the misery the horses endure. The problem of inadequate and lukewarm enforcement remains a large obstacle to the horses actually benefiting from this new law. But I hope that at least a small crumb of additional comfort may be given to them to lessen their physical discomfort and health hazards. I continue to hope that New York tires of its well-deserved criticism for this form of abuse and eliminates the entire carriage horse misery altogether. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Dolling. I am on the board of directors of Tamerlane Sanctuary and Preserve. I am a Park Slope resident, and I fully support Intro 1425, as well as the other bills and resolutions being discussed today. At our sanctuary, we home animals who were rescued from horrible situations of abuse and neglect. We have firsthand experience and knowledge of the abuses animals suffer because of human mistreatment. One of our horses is named Apache. She was used in a sideshow and suffered day in and day out because of it. She would collapse during her performances, much like the horses who have collapsed on the streets of New York City due to exhaustion and being overworked. Her owners would pass it off as nothing serious, have a fraudulent vet uh, look her over, dope her up, and put her right back to work within a couple days, much like the horse carriage industry does with their horses who collapse from being overworked in brutal temperatures. We were lucky enough to be able to rescue her. She now lives at our sanctuary and has taught us so much about the sensitive nature of horses. We witness firsthand how horses are not comfortable in high heat and humidity, and how in the upper 80s, let alone 90 degree days, our horses seek out shelter from the intense heat. Walk the hack lines on a hot summer day and see for yourself. Horses who are panting and suffering is all too common. Protecting these horses from extreme temperatures who work day in and day out, don't get to roam on pasture, and who get locked into horrible stables after their long day of forced work is the least we can do. We're a progressive city that prides itself on helping those in need, and if we can't give these horses this little bit of relief, then we have failed. Open your hearts and put yourself in their shoes. Please pass intro 1425. Everyone at Tamerlane, including our rescued ducks, would also like to voice support for intro 1378 and ban the horrific industry of foie gras. From one sanctuary to another, please support the bills and resolutions today that give a small amount of peace to the suffering animals that dwell in our city. Thank you. Thank you to the Health Committee for holding this hearing concerning an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented amount of animal rights issues, including a ban on the horrifically cruel product of foie gras. My name is Kirsten callister Cooey. I reside in Midtown East Manhattan, and my council member is Ben Kalos. I would like to add that I'm also the daughter and granddaughter of immigrants and the daughter of a refugee for no reason at all. I'm here today to speak in support of Intro 1425, the Carriage Horse Heat Relief Bill. I've lived in New York City since 2000 when I moved to the Upper East Side for college. In those first several years, I moved around the city a lot, but it wasn't until I settled in my current residence in 2008 that I really began to notice carriage horses and the in incredible wrongs that have befallen these beautiful creatures. Residing in Midtown East gave me access to the city in a way I had not yet experienced, and I spent more time walking rather than taking the subway. 
These walks inevitably took me past the infamous hack line on 59th Street where I encountered the carriage horses on a consistent basis for the first time in the eight years I'd been living in New York City. It only took a couple passes past these sullen creatures for me to recognize something was wrong. I walked away thinking, this is horrible. Someone needs to do something about it. Quite literally, the next day, I saw an ad on the side of a telephone booth sponsored by NyClass with Leah Michelle's face on it, and I thought, oh, thank God, someone is doing something. I was not an animal rights activist at the time, and little did I know that day when I signed up to volunteer to help the horses that I would be sitting in front of you more than 10 years later asking for a simple request to curb just some of the suffering of these innocent beings by recognizing that 90 degrees Fahrenheit on the thermometer does not take into consideration humidity and heat index, and also the U.S. Weather Bureau's cited temperature readings are significantly lower than the temperature within the carriage horse's microenvironment. I ask today that the committee members consider that as we run into air-conditioned buildings to escape the torture of a New York City summer, the carriage horses are still standing outside for hours in overwhelming distress because their bodies do not react to the heat and humidity in the same way ours do. I'm not here to kill businesses or destroy lives. I'm simply here for horses, as I have been for the past 10 years, who unfairly have no say in the matter. I ask that you please pass intro 1425 to allow for the horses to get some relief just during the hottest parts of the day and only about 15 days out of the entire summer. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Christina Liu, and I live in Brooklyn, New York, District 43. I will be reading a testimony on behalf of Su Susan Richard, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. I have been a licensed practicing veterinarian in the state of New York for 16 years, I am, and I am a graduate of Cornell University. I am in strong support of Intro 1425, which makes it unlawful for carriage horses to work when the heat index reaches or exceeds 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Horses find it difficult Horses find difficulty dissipating body heat in warm environments, particularly in the temperature range of 89 to 96 degrees, especially if the humidity is high. Horses can lose eight to 10 gallons of fluid with exercise in a hot environment, and if that is coupled with high humidity, the horse cannot cool itself by evaporation because the air is too saturated to absorb more fluid. This results in an elevation of the horse's core temperature. Furthermore, if the horse becomes dehydrated and cannot produce sweat, the lack of sweat production can be life-threatening. New York City horses also have to contend with the temperature that the asphalt reaches on New York City streets on those hot summer days. According to the New York Times article in July 9, 1989, the temperature on the asphalt su surfaces have reached temperatures of 200 degrees. This additional heat source contributes to the heat of the horse's microenvironment and should be taken into account when deciding it is safe for horses to work or not. In light of these facts, I support intro 1425. I'd also like to mention that I am also in support of 1425 and 1378, as well as the many bills that's proposed at today's hearing. Thank you. Good Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Mann and I am here to urge you to support Intro 1425, the Carriage Horse Heat Relief Bill. The title of this bill should really be enough. I live in Manhattan, and I don't need the thermometer to reach 90 degrees to know that it is too hot or too humid to be outside, let alone to be working, pulling hundreds of pounds. That is no low level of exertion. Some things just should not be judged in economic or political terms. We must ask ourselves, why anyone who professes to love or care for another being would want to risk putting that living innocent being at risk for heat stress or total collapse. We as a city need to commit in all ways to being the best possible example. When it comes to animals, all animals, there really are no two sides. They did not choose these lives. They have no choice. They are subject to our whims, and they are subject to our laws. The least we can do, the least we should do, is have our laws protect and help them whenever possible. Sometimes we think of change as a difficult task, but sometimes all that re is required is a small turn. Let's take that small turn. Let's make the changes in the laws, whether it is banning foie gras, protecting wild birds, or helping our horses. How we treat animals is a powerful measure of who we are. Let's take those small turns 
and pass intros 1378, 1202, and before the summer heat hits, intro 1425. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other people who need to rotate into this panel? Was uh, was the name called? Okay, but you th th that may be on the next panel, which will consist of. Uh, Marissa Height from the Animal Law Committee, <coughs> Eleanor Molbegat from Humane Society of New York, Eileen Jefferson, Ethical Vet Veterinary Association, Adita Bernkrant, Kim Klaus, Nathan Semmel, Kirk Miller, and Deborah Thomas. Did that clear up the, apparently it did. Okay, please kick us off, thank you. Hello, my name is Marissa Height and I'm a New York attorney testifying on behalf of the New York City Bar Association's Animal Law Committee. We urge the Committee on Health to vote in favor of intro 1425, which would prohibit operating carriage horses once the National Weather Service's heat index reaches 90 degrees. The Animal Law Committee supports intro 1425 because it better protects carriage horses from New York's hot and humid weather, and by doing so, furthers animal welfare in our community. The bill requires use of the National Weather Service heat index to determine when it is too hot for carriage horses to be worked. The heat index measures how hot it really feels when relative humidity is combined with air temperature. For example, if the air temperature is 88 degrees and relative humidity is 80 percent, then the heat index or real field temperature is 106 degrees. This makes intuitive sense. As any New Yorker knows, humidity makes a hot day feel hotter. By tying heat restrictions to the real field temperature, the bill extends the city's history of protecting carriage horses from the elements. The city's first significant legislation regulating the carriage horse industry, enacted 30 years ago this year, was introduced in response to several incidences where carriage horses collapsed or died during heat waves. We note that Department of Health and Mental Hygiene heat regulations account for humidity to some extent. Carriage horses may not be driven once the wet bulb temperature has reached 85 degrees, yet the bulb metric can differ significantly from the real field temperature measured by the heat index. For example, an 86 degree air temperature and 90% relative humidity means a wet bulb temperature of just over 83 degrees, conditions in which carriage horses could still work. Using the heat index, however, these same conditions really feel like 105 degrees. In summary, intro 1425 would better protect New York's carriage horses and further the city's animal welfare goals. The New York City Bar Association's Animal Law Committee therefore urges the Committee on Health to vote in favor of the bill. Our written comment provides additional reasons for our position and includes citations to relevant laws and supporting evidence. Thanks. It's on. My name is Eleanor Malbigat. I'm an attorney for the Humane Society of New York. I've been practicing animal law for 40 years. In fact, when I was at the ASPCA more than 40 years ago, horse protection was the first thing on my plate. We strongly support 1425 to provide for the protection of carriage horses. What's interesting is that Decades ago, the New York City Health Department recognized that humidity needed to be taken into consideration, and there's a law, as was just mentioned, there's a rule on the books already dealing with wet bulb readings, so that it was already understood that humidity should be a factor, and this legislation will help to codify that yet in a better way. So when the industry speaks about just counting temperature as compared to humidity as if humidity is a new factor that's being brought up suddenly. No, this is not a sudden thing. This has been on the books for decades. It's just not been enforced. 
So we do need a law that will be better enforced, and this also brings to my mind how important it is to have a separate Department of Animal Welfare, because perhaps had there been a Department of Animal Welfare, the wet bulb reading rule would have already been enforced, even if it needed to be stronger. There would have been some uh, enforcement of laws that took into consideration humidity, and that hasn't been done. We strongly support uh, legislation to ban the capturing of wild birds. We've received at the Humane Society so many complaints and personally have seen so much horror imposed upon our city's birds that whether they end up on a dinner plate or at a pigeon shoot, it needs to be stopped. We of course support a ban on force feeding birds and support strongly intro 1378. Worth Thanks. noting is that California has a similar law and Supreme, it's been upheld in the courts. The Supreme Court recently, just this year, denied certiorari. Uh, our other comments are here, so I, uh, you have them there. I just want to finally thank the City Council in my 40 years of coming to the City Council to testify. I have to say this is the most humane City Council that I have ever seen and it's really a pleasure, so thank you very much. Well, we appreciate that feedback. Thank you very much. Usually the ratio of positive to negative feedback is not very good, but today, <laughs> today I'm liking the numbers. Thank you. Please. Honor Honorable New York City Council members, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Dr. Eileen Jefferson. As a New York State licensed and practicing veterinarian, I fully support intro 1425, the carriage horse heat relief bill. In addition to my veterinary training, I have over 15 years of personal hands-on equine care experience, which has included horse ownership and competitive show jumping, as well as work at the Cornell University Hospital for Animals Equine Ward and the John T. Oxley Equestrian Center at Cornell University. I'm here to testify about the science and the facts. So ambient humidity is absolutely, positively one of the most crucial factors in determining and exercising horses' susceptibility to heat stress, heat stroke, collapse, and death. Under New York City's current law, however, humidity is not considered at all. Intro 1425's proposed cutoff is a National Weather Service heat index of 90. This translates to 84 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of 70%, or 82, 82 degrees <coughs> Fahrenheit and 85% relative humidity. The sums of these, if you add them, these temperatures and humidities are 154 and 167, respectively. An American Association of Equine Practitioners resource plainly states that when the temperature and humidity exceed 150 together, it is hard for a horse to keep cool. Even at 130, there are some muscular horses whose cooling system simply will not function. This is why most equine associations urge caution in exercising horses anywhere above 120. It is an indisputable medical fact that if the humidity becomes high enough, an exercising horse can incur serious physical compromise and distress at a temperature below 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, in horse country, it's rare to hear these numerics being so analyzed because basic horsemanship and horse sense would, would normally preclude working horses continually in the weather extremes currently in question. It's important to ensure that New York City, one of the most prominent and progressive cities in the world, is currently abiding by the fundamentals on every issue this issue of safety and animal welfare being no exception. <clears throat> and I'd also like to say that on behalf of the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, we support, and our 9,000 members nationwide and 300 in New York, we absolutely support intro 1378 to ban foie gras. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. My name is Adita Bernkrant, and I'm the Executive Director of NICLASS, here today to express our strongest support for passage of intro 1425. As a lifelong New York City resident who has dedicated over a decade of my life to documenting, reporting, and exposing the dismal conditions of the horses, I will tell you that it is absolutely necessary to improve the heat laws for the horses, which have never been updated since they've been enacted. As has been said, the current law only stops horses from working when the air temperature is 90 or above, and this is inadequate because horses' natural cooling ability through sweating is compromised when the air is saturated with humidity. As a result, New York City summers are a torment for horses who are forced to work during high humidity heat waves when air temperatures don't yet reach 90. This past summer, I documented horses on the streets strapped and chained to carriages weighing several hundred pounds doing heavy labor 
during citywide heat advisories when the real field temperature and the heat index was soaring to 100. In just one horrifying instance, from last August, I filmed a carriage horse in a state of serious heat stress in oppressively humid, sweltering conditions, gasping for breath in agony. On a day that both the Department of Health and the National Weather Service issued severe citywide heat advisories to all residents and their pets, warning them to limit time outdoors. Yet carriage drivers were legally still allowed to be working the horses in these dangerous conditions. How can we continue to allow this abuse to go on in our progressive, compassionate city? Intro 1425 would merely stop horses from being worked during the hours the National Weather Service heat index reaches or exceeds 90. I beg of each of you on this council to finally show some mercy for these carriage horses by passing intro 1425. The horses will get no mercy from carriage drivers who will continue to work them in hazardous heat waves this summer and every summer until the city council passes this bill. You have the power to end this abuse. Thank you, Adita. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kim Klaus and I am the owner and operator of North Jersey Equestrian in Northwest New Jersey for the past 26 years. I have been working with horses and caring for horses, riding and training horses for the past 26 years. I have 30 horses that I provide daily care for with the help of three employees on two separate farms. <clears throat> I teach the disciplines of dressage and eventing. I am here today to express my support for intro 1425, the carriage horse heat relief bill, and I urge the health committee to vote yes. Every day of my life is dedicated to caring for 30 horses, and I feel strongly that the New York City law needs to be changed so that the carriage horses no longer have to work when the heat index is over 90 degrees. Most of the carriage horses are draft horses that are big, heavy and very thick bodied and cannot easily cool their bodies when the temperature plus humidity is over 90 degrees compared with a smaller, lighter bodied horse. Working in conditions with the heat index reaching 90 degrees and over is very dangerous to the health and well-being of the horses, especially when they are pulling heavy carriages and have no chance of being watered down or put in the shade. I reviewed a video of a horse from last summer that is clearly suffering from heat stress and is a very good example of why these horses shouldn't be working in those humid heat waves. I have also become aware that the spokesperson for the carriage horse industry apparently has bragged about using the drug Ventipulmin on horses suffering heat stress or respiratory issues in the summer, and I'm shocked and find this very troubling and something that should be investigated. Ventipulmin is indicated for the management of horses with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, not heat stress. In all my years working with horses, I have never and would never do this. A horse that requires the use of Ventipulmin has severe respiratory disease and by no means should be working, let alone pulling a carriage in a humid heat wave. Ventipulmin has been banned by many racing and equine sport associations. I can't stress enough my support for passing intro 1425 to protect the health and well-being of the carriage horses during extreme heat and humidity. I just would like to add one thing um, to add to Kim's. We have the uh, tweets from Christina Hansen bragging about using this drug Ventipulmin, and I really think there should be an investigation into that being used. That is an outrage. The veterinarian here on the panel can tell you that. Something is seriously wrong if they are drugging these horses with this drug that's been banned. And we also, I also, speaking of we mentioned the video that I took last summer that was supposed to be played, but unfortunately due to technical difficulties, it cannot play. But I am happy to send that to each of you on the, the committee to show you exactly just one example of what happens when these horses are, are being forced to work doing heavy labor in high humidity heat waves. And uh, we are able to enter that video onto the record. Thank you. Um, and we certainly will review it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three more uh, speakers for this panel. So if I could ask a little seat swap here because we want to hear from everybody. Oh, only, that's great, thank you. Only three of you, or more, that's fine.
Okay, please. My name is Nathan Semmel. I'm an attorney, a lifelong New Yorker, and I proudly live in District 7. You don't have to be an expert on child abuse to spot a kid who is hurting. You don't have to be an expert on domestic violence to recognize a tormented spouse. You don't have to be a canine expert to identify the anguished stare of an abandoned dog. And you don't have to be an expert on equines to know what a distressed horse looks like. Suffering is universal, and so are its signs. The current heat regulation is insufficient because it does not account for the single most impactful metric, humidity. I'm a runner. I run in Central Park. I don't need to see the night class videos of suffering horses. I've seen them for myself for years. Horses heavily panting, heads bobbing, struggling, sluggish, just like I feel when I go out for a run on a hot and humid day. But you know what? I get to slow down if I want. I get to have as much water as I want when I want it. I get to rest when I want. I get to stop when I want. And I get to decide if I don't want to even run at all. I have observed the horse carriage industry for years. They will tell you they care for the horses like family. Now a dose of reality. They will never resist a fair on a brutally hot, humid day. They will never rest the panting, head bobbing, and sluggish horse out of the goodness of their hearts. And they will never not work their horses on a high heat index day unless it's the law. When is the last time a safety or comfort measure was offered to this industry that they accepted? Never. They will tell you they love their horses? No. They love what their horses can do for them. This bill is not about money or politics. This bill is progressive, it's selfless, it's about compassion, and it's right. The horse carriage industry should be counting their lucky stars that we're not debating abolishment like we've seen in so many other cities worldwide. Intro 1425 is a no-brainer. Please vote yes. Thank you very much, and thank you for living in District 7. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Kirk Miller. I'm a resident of Manhattan and a supporter of Intro 1425, the Carriage Horse Heat Relief Bill. I am also not an expert on horses, nor do I pretend to be one. The real experts have already testified. I have spent some time around horses. I grew up in the country around both farm animals and domesticated animals, some wild animals. Today I rescue and help cats and other animals in Harlem. I've seen animals in pain, animals dying. I've interviewed, intervened and had, a put, uh, had to put a few down. I do think I know when an animal is in distress. It actually doesn't take an expert, just an empathetic person. I've seen New York City carriage horses in distress. I've seen panting carriage horses, limping carriage horses, carriage horses with fly leg wraps covering open sores on their legs, and carriage horses collapsing in the heat. And it is hot out there. The hottest four years on record are the past four years. In 2018, I measured the surface temperature of the asphalt on 59th Street at nearly 120 degrees, and that was not even a significantly hot day. And now one of the leading horse experts in the world, uh, who was an expert in horse carriages herself, says it can go up to 200 degrees on the asphalt. The current guidelines don't take any of this into consideration. Dr. Cheever was reluctant to even testify here because she wants a ban on the industry. Uh, which a lot of people do. A lot of people are rethinking their relationships with the creatures with whom we share the city and the planet. I think that's why we have so many of these bills, animal-related bills, being presented today. All the more reason to support Intro 1478, establishing a Department of Animal Welfare in New York City. Animals need our help. So I enthusiastically support Intro 1425, the Carriage Horse Heat Relief Bill. The laws need to be updated, and this is not a big ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to another resident of District 7, Deborah Thomas. Thank you, a proud resident of District 7. Um, my name is Deborah Thomas, and I am a New York City resident, animal advocate, and humane voter. 
I support the passage of intro 1425, the carriage horse uh, heat relief bill, because I feel that having horses pulling hundreds of pounds on city streets in New York City during very humid heat waves is extremely cruel to the horses and dangerous to everyone, because under those circumstances, the horse the horses uh, risk heat stress and collapsing. Since the current law does not take real feel and humid uh, humidity of the horses into consideration, I strongly favor uh, changing the current law to take into consideration the heat index when it reaches 90 degrees uh, and to, uh, considering humidity levels. I respectfully urge you to pass intro 1425 because it will keep the poor horses from suffering through any future brutal, humid New York City heat waves. I would also like to add that I would support intro 1478, the bill that would create an animal welfare department, if the language were to be amended to number one, cover all animal issues, including carriage horses, wildlife, and overseeing animal shelters. And number two, if it were to assure that continuity at the animal care centers would continue. Uh, I am aware that there is there are some plans to make changes in language of that uh, bill, and I applaud that. Also, as a longtime volunteer at the animal care centers at the Manhattan shelter, I could, I could only support intro 1478 if it plans to work within the existing framework of the ACC and improve upon the numerous positive changes and improvements that have already been made there over the past few years. That would uh, include retaining current members of the administration and staff who have come up through the ranks, who have been volunteers at the shelters, and know firsthand what needs to be done uh, about animal welfare and so on. What I would not support would be replacing those people with political appointees who might only be there for photo ops and a paycheck. And I want to thank Councilman Levine and uh, this whole wonderful city council for doing all you're doing for animals. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, I believe that Councilmember Rosenthal has a question. I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Andy Cohen. Um, I have a quick question for the woman who introduced herself as a veterinarian. Yes, that's me. <laughs> okay, thank you. You mentioned that uh, you were in support of the ban on foie gras. Do yes. You, do you have any experience or any inside uh, insight about the cruelty of um, the I mechanism do, I do, I have of a, feeding I have a, the duck. I have a statement about that, um, which I wrote, which is, according to the American Veterinary Medical Association, um, their 2014 literature review on foie gras, it, it takes a very unfavorable stance on foie gras in terms of the information that it presents. And one of the things that it mentions is that the livers of foie gras ducks, when they, when they are, when they're enlarged, they're enlarged to 10 times their normal size. And people who support foie gras will often say that it's natural because they're, they're seasonally fattened, that the ducks do this naturally. But when the ducks do it naturally, it's only 1.3 to 1.5 times the normal size of the liver. So there's a huge difference there. It's, it's a completely different thing. 1.3, you know, 1.3, 1.5 is a totally different thing than 10 times the size. When the liver is that large, it is, as people mentioned earlier, it impinges on the air sacs of the bird. It makes them unable to breathe properly, unable to stand properly, and it also makes them more likely to have injuries during transport and susceptibility to heat stress. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to this panel. We're going to move on to the next panel which is Jesus Ponce from Hudson Valley Foie Gras, Jenny Chamberlain, also Hudson Valley, Marcus Henley, Marcus Lingerman from Christ Healthcare Ministry, Dr. Lawrence Bartoff, Erwin Grome from Hudson Valley, Izzy Yancey, Hudson Valley, 
Robert Ambrose from Bell Bella Gourmet Foods. Uh, Chris DeRose. I have here Sergio Seravia. I'm not sure if, if Mr. Seravia has already spoken, but if it's someone different. Okay, then, then we'll call up Sergio Seravia. And we thank you for your patience as we swap people out on this very large panel. Um, and uh, sir, on the end, would you like to start us off? If you could uh, pull the mic over to you, please, and make sure it's on. Can you hear me now? All right, good. So, my name is Izzy Yanai. I'm the founder and one of the owners of Hudson Valley Foie Gras and Le Ferme Hudson Valley in Quebec, in uh, Hudson Valley in Sullivan County, and I'm here in opposition to Intro 1378. First, I want to applaud the noble and difficult work that the animal rights people here in front of me which I'm proud to be one of, by the way, and what they are doing and trying to do in improving the cares of animals. Only that in the case of the ducks, the geese, and the foie gras farming, they are unfortunately misguided and missing the mark. Even though it does look that the birds are going through an ordeal, our observation combined, combined with the observation of many veterinarians, scientists, and visitors and my own experience of more than 45 years show that the ducks are not bothered by the hand feeding that is done by dropping the feed into the esophagus using a tube, like they said. It is very difficult for me to make my point here at City Hall, trying to make you understand something that at the farm you could see in an instant as many, many visitors Many chefs, journalists, students from all walks of life have come and realized over many, many years, people said here that we are not transparent. This is not true. We are transparent, but I'll talk about it in a second. Judging by the duck's behavior, which I have observed, as I said, for some 45 years of experience, I can assure you that it doesn't hurt them the way it will most definitely hurt us or the dogs or the cats. Dr. Bartolf will talk after me and explain the physiology of the ducks. They do not exhibit any behavior that show that they are afraid of their feeders and are very calm and content. Now, I heard a lot of comments before. Some of them were absolutely true, but some were not. Especially there was a, a woman, a very sincere woman, that spoke before and talked about aversion behavior of the ducks towards their feeders. This is exactly the point that I'm trying to make by inviting you that before you make a decision, any decision, which I will completely abide by, but you need to come to see what happens. You don't want to come yourself Send somebody. Thousands of people are coming every day of the week, seven days, for years and years. And all of them, besides some lady here. And, and came thank out. you. We, 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 we do appreciate that. And we're just over time. So hold on, I, I, didn't I, I need second. to ask you to wrap up. Hold on, hold on. And I will be the first to support a ban on any food that is obtained by harming and torturing animals, any animals. But here, it is not the case. And as every farmer knows, the treatment and the condition of our animals Thank you. yields, I didn't finish. Well, we, ha we have a two minute time limit, sir. Give me one more second. Okay, you're, you're, you're okay. way over time. We have- Must be, okay, torturing animals. All these people waiting to speak, a big pile. Oh yeah, yeah, stop me. Okay. okay, thank you. Your full comments will be entered into the record. If you'd like to submit the written remarks to the sergeant, then they will be part of the record of this hearing. Okay. Please, sir.
Hello, I am Jesus Ponce. I work at Hudson Valley for GRA. I am here to opposite to introduce you on 1378. I came to the United States in 1981. I was one of the first uh, people hired by the farm in 1983. I became a citizen of the United States through my work at the farm and, and with the help of the owner, Isi Janay. Many of us uh, at the farm become citizens in this way. I have done well. My daughter is working at the farm this summer before she goes back to college at the University of, the, of Rochester. The first one in my family to study pol political science. The farm has given my family and all of the farm a chance to be part of the part of this country, to have a better life and make an even better life for our children. The farm takes good care of the animals. If you don't take good care of the animals, it doesn't make no sense. You have to take care good of the animals to to be able to make a profit. The way we feed the ducks might seem strange, but if you know about animals, you can see feeding the ducks does not hurt them. I have talked to veterinarians and they explain why is this true. It's the same as judging me as a bad person when you, you don't know me. There have been people saying bad things about the farm for a long time. They are not true. I don't really understand this, and I wish it will not happen. We spend a lot of time defeating ourselves that we'll better spend taking care of the animals in the farm. We have visitors with the, we, we have, uh, visitors who tour the farm all, all the time. We expect people to visit us and, the, and that makes us better than any other farms I know. The okay. farm does not. That's uh, just, we wanna make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. So if you could just wrap up, cause we're giving everybody a time allocation, okay? Okay. So uh, we you just like finish your last thought so we can okay, move on to okay. this. Thank we, you. we treat the animals, we have a good, place to work and uh, we could not work at the farm, maybe go find another job. If I couldn't work in the farm, maybe I can find another job, but no one the, the work, I worked for 25 years and may, made a living. So I can send my daughter to college. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just stepping in for Cheryl Levine for a few moments. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Jenny Chamberlain. I'm the chef and general manager of further processing for Hudson Valley Foie Gras. I've been with the farm family for uh, over seven years and I'm here in total opposition of intro 1378. Um, I'm a former resident of Brooklyn. Uh, now I, I now live on the farm with my longtime partner, Michelle. Uh, I have two dogs, a cat and a tortoise. So I put those cards out there, happy pride. And uh, I am appalled by the proposed legislation to each their own, but without having a true ed education of the practices at Hudson Valley Foie Gras and La Belle Farms. Our truth is the reality of American produced foie gras. That truth is 90 miles away and a short trip would answer your questions and concerns. Most importantly, the ducks will tell their story in both their appearance and behavior. The behavior of not being afraid and the appearance of not being wounded or lying around dead. The first thing I did before accepting my position was tour the farm to learn. I ultimately made my decision based on being 100% behind the practices that I saw. This opportunity has proven to be well beyond personal economic gain I have found a greater purpose in my life and profession, helping the farm move towards total utilization of the animal, meaning yes, we're first and foremost foie gras, 
but from the breast we make duck bacon, duck ham, we make barbacoa, the legs, duck leg confit, the trim, sausages, rillette, and the bones we sell for pet food. Nothing is wasted or taken for granted. Um, and those efforts have personally uh, created 40 jobs for over, for, uh, for out of the over 300 uh, total employees. So this is not just a job, it is my life, and I'm here to fight for the livelihood of all the employees who depend on us and the families who depend on them, and why would any one of us hurt the ducks that we all depend on? If this ban is passed, it will be in vain and devastating to many. I ask you to please come see for yourself and to take the opportunity to be true heroes and work with us to write good practices for foie gras production in New York. Thank you. And thank you as a turtle mom. You said you had a tortoise. So. He's gonna outlive us all, my tortoise. I'm Marcus, the manager of Hudson Valley Foie Gras, and uh, I'm against uh, 1378. I sleep with my dog, okay? Uh, the New York Times editorial board, Village Voice, Esquire, Chicago Tribune, uh, have uh, all published articles saying that they found nothing after journalists visited the farm improper about are inhumane about our farming practices. Uh, this, is, this is not the first time the New York City Council has considered uh, banning foie gras. And several years ago, Councilman Alan Gerson had the integrity to send an investigator to inspect our farm. That was Paul Nagel, who's the executive director of the Stonewall Community Development Corporation. After his recommendation, Councilman Gerson uh, dropped his attempt to ban foie gras. Uh, former uh, Bronx Assemblyman, State Assemblyman Michael Benjamin, uh, after introducing legislation at the state level to ban foie gras, during the visit, stopped and told the group of people that was with him, I think Dr. Bartoff was there that day, that I've been lied to. And he withdrew his support for his own bill. The truth, we're gonna, these, wonderful, well-meaning people on both sides, uh, and we listen to, to, to each of them, the importance of our jobs and the economics that's uh, very different in a rural economy, uh, but you're not gonna find the truth here today, but the truth is two and a half hours away, and uh, for God's sake, send somebody to see what we do, because it's very hard to describe, and you can look at all the pictures you want, but seeing is a true thing. The other thing is, uh, Supreme Court didn't take the California lawsuit. They sent it back to federal district court. We're in our eighth year of litigation in federal court. And uh, I just want to share that this type of legislation is unconstitutional. We overturned the California ban once, we will again, and we would immediately contest this kind of legislation not only for ourselves, but farmers everywhere uh, because it's unconstitutional. Thank you. My name is <clears throat> Mark Langerman. I'm the executive director for Christ Healthcare Ministry. We're concerned that the banning of the sale of foie gras products will result in reduced or eliminated access to healthcare for poor migrant farm workers in Sullivan and Orange County, New York. That's why I'm here in opposition to introduction 1378. Our Ferndale Free Medical Clinic, which was built and is heavily supported by Hudson Valley Foie Gras, is the only free medical clinic in Sullivan County. If that funding is eliminated, it would, lim it would eliminate the only healthcare option for our patients, many of whom are poor migrant farmers. Our clinic manages more than 260 patient visits per year, more than 1,000 in the five years of our existence. Christ Healthcare Ministry provides healthcare at no cost to those without access to insurance. The ministry is a, 50, is a federal 501c3. The medical providers, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants all volunteer their time. 
If we lose the financial support of the Hudson Valley for Gras, it would impair our ability to open and maintain our free Warwick New York Clinic as well, which is slated to open on July 1st. The Warwick Free Clinic is surrounded by a large migrant population of more than 300 families who lack medical insurance and the financial resources to obtain reliable, caring, comprehensive medical aid. Our patients receive primary care, lab and radiologic support, phlebotomy, and the subspecialties of cardiology, general surgery, hematology, oncology, nephrology, orthopedics, rheumatology, urology, wound care, endocrinology, dermatology, nephrology, OBGYN, et cetera. Prior to the installation of the CHCM clinic in Ferndale, our patients did not have access to health care or necessary medications. Now our patients have a medical home. They're seen by a stable set of medical providers. There are repeat patients who are patient who are comfortable coming into the clinic. We are um, collaborating, we collaborate with the Catskills Regional Medical Center, um, and we are seeing evidence of reduced A1C levels and reduced blood pressure in our patients. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Thank you. I'm Dr. Lawrence Barthoff, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. I'm here in opposition to Introduction 1378. For the last 50 years, I have been a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, specializing in the care of farm animals. I am past president of the New York State Veterinary Medical Society, and I have long been active in animal welfare causes. I was the first recipient of the American Veterinary Medical Association's Animal Welfare Award in 1990. In the course of my career, I've had many opportunities to observe firsthand the practices of Hudson Valley foie gras. America's largest foie gras farm and the only one of three remaining in the United States. I first visited Hudson Valley Foie Gras about 30 years ago to investigate an animal welfare complaint as an, and I was an active member of the Sullivan County Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals at that time. In the years since, I have visited the farm with many animal welfare and veterinary groups. In 2006, I accompanied a group of veterinarians from the American Veterinary Medical Association and we all inspected the farm at that time. Here, I'd like to divert a little bit, digress from my written part, and I would like to cover some misconceptions that I've heard earlier today. One is that the liver has been described as diseased in these ducks, and they say they have hepatosis. Well, yes, they do. Hepatosis is the medical term for fatty liver. Foie gras is fatty liver. While this would be abnormal in humans and usually the cause of death, it's not abnormal in birds. And it's a normal ability that birds have because they migrate and lay eggs. Two other things, these ducks pant because and they're wrapped in- Just to wrap up your testimony. They're wrapped in down and they pant just like your dog does to control their body temperature. And the esophagus, which I would love to cover, and that would take me three minutes all by itself, but it's flexible, it's durable, and that's what allows a, a wild, uh, a waterfowl to have a fish, a live fish and fins that you wouldn't be able to hold in your hand in its throat and not be damaged. That's why a feeding tube is a non-event for them. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Were we waiting for anyone else to come and sit down and also give testimony? Because we do have a few, qu I'm sure we have questions. We do for the physicians. Doctor. Yeah, if you could just remain for a second. The workers can leave. We will have questions for the three on the left.
We're going to allow Council Member uh, Rosenthal to jump in with uh, a question or two now. Yeah. And, and, and Council Member. Member. And then the remainder of the people will testify for sure. I appreciate that, Chair. Of course, I, please. Um, I, I, I really want to ask the doctor a couple of questions. Have you seen farms where the ducks are not treated humanely? No, but I have not seen any farm other than Hudson Valley foie gras, and after all, there are only three in the United States. You had said that many years ago you visited a bunch of farms. This farm. Only this, this farm. farm. Yes. So you don't have anything to compare it to. Well, I grew up on a on a farm. And, Was it and a farm I, that had force feeding of the ducks? No. Okay. No. And then, secondly, um, I want to know what it what your response is to this notion of a liver growing by one and a half times versus ten times yes the liver has the potential to grow ten times in in birds all birds and it's the reason because they lay eggs which takes a lot of fat in a very very short period of time also to cover periods of starvation and also to cover migration when the birds are flying and not able to eat. And so, so, so birds have the ability to store fat mm -hmm. around their body like we do, but also in their liver, which is unique to birds. Ten times. And it can expand and as much when, as ten I times. I guess my question was the three instances that you just mentioned are all, you know, how often do they lay eggs? How often do they migrate? Is it on a daily basis that it's common for a bird to be at 10 times the liver size every single day of its life? No, of course not, because it is used for. I, I don't know, I'm not a physician, but that is what happens in these situations. For a matter of a few, a uh, few weeks, yes. For a matter of a few weeks, could you explain that to me? Well, for actually three, about three weeks is when they're in the final stages of the feeding. Okay, up until, and uh, Marcus can tell you better. Before they're killed for the use of the before liver. Before they're slaughtered, yes. Okay, let's just. I just wanted to be clear about that. So it's not that they could function after their liver is 10 times the normal size. As a matter of fact, what because has happened, a researcher in France brought these birds up to that where they were, the liver was at its uh, maximum extent, and then the birds were not hungry, so they were allowed to, uh, at, at their own will, not to eat, the liver shrank down, and then they could re-fill re, uh, it again with fat. It is a normal procedure in the wild. It doesn't go to 10 times in the wild. It does expand when they're eating in the fall when there's lots of grain and as they're preparing to migrate. Uh, 10 times the size. It can go Every single size. day of its life. I just think there's a difference. Not every single day of its life only when it's at the end when it's being uh, tube fed for the purpose of slaughter that's right okay um and then if you could just explain to me um what is in the mixture that is fed to the duck it's a mixture of protein and starch protein and starch what does and, that mean and, well it's uh Pro, uh, the protein fraction is primarily soybeans, and the starch fraction is primarily uh, corn. This is a combination of grains that are fed to all of our domestic animals. It's nothing uh, unusual. Can I? Um, sir. Are you employed by the farm in any no. way? No. As a consultant? As a consultant uh, and asked to come uh, to some to testimony like this. 
Are you paid as a consultant? On occasion. Okay, no. Yes. I just was curious to know. Um, and what, how am I to respond to the testimony of the um, uh, the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, um, which says on behalf of 9,000 members nationwide and 300 in New York, um, who endorse the passage of this bill. That's the Humane Society of the United States. No, uh, the Humane Veterinary Medical Association. That is. Uh, another veterinary medical association, an association of veterinarians. Uh, it is not the American Veterinary Medical Association. Do which you is, represent the American Veterinary I am Association? A member, I am a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association, which is a membership, which is the original membership of approximately 90. And do you have a statement from them? Do I have a statement from yeah, them? Yeah, I'm just trying to. Right. How, understand how to respond to this. Right. Um, one person compared to 300 in New York, 9,000 nationwide. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I just want to remind uh, our colleagues and everybody that we have over 50 people waiting to testify. With and we, we lose the room in an hour, so we're going to try and really keep this moving. But please, please, Council Member Rivera. Uh, I just want to follow up on Council Member Rosenthal's question. How long would the duck live for if it was fed at the same rate but not slaughtered? If you're feeding, do you understand the question? Yeah, it, it, uh, as, long as, it, as long as it's normal life, it would probably be, I mean. If it's fed at the same rate and its liver was as enlarged, it would live to the same duration of a what, normal duck. What, right. What happens in these birds is once the liver reaches its maximum, okay, it's like if you want to think of an assembly line, like in a Ford uh, assembly line plant, if they don't need any more cars down at the end of the line, they don't start any more at the beginning. I, and I, when I, you're, I, I when, appreciate the analogy, but I don't want to compare the, a living thing to a car. So give right, me one second. What, my point? I, I want to just say, because I don't have a lot of time, and we do have a lot of people right, that I want to hear right. from. So you mentioned about the, the migratory factors of the birds and their natural habits. But from what I've read, at most, the, that enlargement is at three times, not 10. And then the second thing I will add is that many other vets, including the former wildlife pathologist for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, they have a completely different view of the health and safety of foie gras. So of course, professionals will disagree. Right. So we appreciate your testimony and trying to answer some of our questions, but I, I feel um, that, again, a lot of my questions now are, will, will really be for the farmers, so I asked Chair Levine if you want to move on. I'm happy to do so, and I thank you all for your testimony and for giving us time. I, I really do. <clears throat> thank you, Council Member Rivera. And I think we have additional witnesses on this panel. Is that right? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Robert Ambrose. I'm the managing partner of Bella Bella Gourmet, and I am here in strong opposition of 1378. How many of you here today can say you visited our farms in Sullivan County or have a understanding of the physiology of a duck? The reality is just a short drive away, and you can see how the ducks are treated and how much economic impact we have on the area. Bella Bella Gourmet is a wholesaler and transforming kitchen of foie gras, duck, and poultry products. We distribute our products in New York City, across the country, and around the globe. Prior to partnering with LaBelle Farms, I wanted to see the farm. I went up and worked every aspect of the farm, toured every building, total transparency. I wanted to see what they were doing. What I was, saw was how the farmers treated the birds, how they treated their employees. It was amazing. Whenever I take a group of chefs now up there, 
I see the same thing, and so does the chefs that we have tour there. The birds have clean, dry bedding, fresh water, and food. It is evident that they show respect for the birds as well as the employees. The entire birds are utilized. Nothing goes to waste. The employees receive monetary incentives based on how they handle the birds, so exceptional care is taken at each step of the growing. Over the past 15 years, I've conducted many tests, um, many um, tours for journalists, chefs, restaurateurs, and inquisitive individuals. When a visitor views the interaction between the farmers, staff, and birds firsthand, it is astounding. Demanding chefs can recognize quality product by taste, smell, looks, and how it reacts in cooking. When these chefs experience how the birds are raised and treated, and are proud to serve our foie gras in their establishment. It makes us so happy. I ask that if mo before moving forward with 1378, you take time to visit our farms, see the birds, see the people, see the area. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Please. Hello, I am Erwin Grom, General Manager of Hudson Valley Chicken, LLC. I'm here in opposition to the introduction 1378. Hudson Valley Chicken provides high quality certified humane and organic chickens to the markets, restaurants, and the restaurants in this region. Our facility shares resources such as transportation and wastewater treatment with Hudson Valley Foie Gras. We fear the loss of Hudson Valley Foie Gras would raise our costs significantly and put our business at risk. Our chickens are grown on family farms in Pennsylvania. Large chicken companies demand farmers have expensive upgrades to their buildings or new buildings to work with them. We work with farmers with older but well-maintained facilities without us. Dozens of these farms would be very difficult to find work for them to keep continue. Hudson Valley Chicken is also one of the very few facilities in the Northeast that allows very small farmers to bring their chickens or other poultry to us for processing. They can bring a few birds or they can bring several more. Uh, and we give them back to fully processed under USDA inspection product. This facility has created opportunities for many small farms to bring their products to farmers markets in the region. We processed for almost 200 small farms last year. Loss of this service would be crushing and force many of these farmers to discontinue producing poultry. Those that continue would be forced to distance processors raising their costs and their products in their markets significantly. I also want to say that working with Hudson Valley Foie Gras and comparing our certified humane chicken operation with their duck operation, the ducks are very well cared for. I have seen the farming statistics reflecting proper care of animals that exceeds the certified humane standards. The other issue is that it is not understood that many products from poultry that would have almost impossible to separate from New York City market without great disruption to companies across the country. Most, store, most stores selling pet treats and food have products made from duck. Many ducks are sold whole and there are no, there are no leftover materials. Foie gras ducks are deboned and the bones are, and trimming are used in pet products. It is almost certain Every store selling pet products in New York City has duck from foie gras farms. Further, all the feathers from the duck processing are, processing are saved, clean, and dried for use in down clothing, bedding, and pillows. The bill is very threatening to the 60 people working at Hudson Valley Chicken and the many, many farmers we support. We reject introduction 1378. Thank you, sir, and I believe this concludes our panel. Oh, one more, forgive me, please. Hi, my name is Sergio Saravia. Um, I'm in opposition to 1378. Um, I was born in El Salvador, and it was during the Civil War. And the, the earliest childhood memory that I have is of my mother being severely beaten because soldiers came to our house assuming that we had money and they wanted to rob us. We, we watched our mother get beaten. We, we had to move from our town to another town. And then we walked to the United States. Our country never gave us any protection from the guerrilla or the soldiers. When we got here as refugees, we weren't given asylum. Imputed political opinion wasn't recognized as a claim for political asylum. The only people that stepped up to help us was Izzy from Hudson Valley. Gave my father a job. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment, 11 of us. He signed so that they could sponsor my father. 
and we got legal that way. We went to, I went to school. We went to a school where I was the only Spanish guy, and I wasn't meant to be in school. I wasn't meant to do anything good because of where I came from, because of the language that I spoke. I went to college, same thing. I actually had a teacher tell me, you're not going to graduate. You're not going to do well. You're not going to be an attorney. I made it as an attorney. I'm Spanish, so automatically I'm supposed to be something that was like everybody else from my country. MS-13, those people know about torture. We come to work. We work seven days a week from when I was 11 to this day. We work with every person on that farm. There's over 400 people between the two farms. Whether you go visit or not, I need you to at least do something before you pass it and make generalizations like other people do, like our country did to us because we couldn't have neutrality. Like when the immigration system denied us something because we didn't have the right claim. Here we stand with some generalizations about people who are against what we do. We, we are workers. These are our families. This is our community. 1% to you is 100% to us. I can walk away from them now that I'm an attorney. I will never do that because that's my family. Every person in here, that's my family. I don't walk away from it. Okay, folks, please, please. Um, uh, Mr. Saravia, I want to I want to thank you for speaking out today. I want you to know that independent of the debate we're having here around legislation, that I salute you and celebrate you and your family. I think you embody uh, the best of the American dream, uh, and. Uh, you, you, you have our full support as people who uh, undoubtedly have helped make New York a better place, have helped make this country a better place. Um, and I thank you for that. And thank you for your bravery in speaking out today. Your, your opinion very much matters. Thank you. But I, I do need to, folks, we, we, we We've done very well with uh, a respectful atmosphere in here, and I want I don't want to break from that as we enter the home stretch of the hearing. Um, and Councilmember Rivera has a question. I had a question for the the managers of the farm. I don't know if if you want to come back to the microphone. And I appreciate you uh, swapping with your colleagues. So just quickly, because I know we, we are, there are a lot of people here to testify. How many ducks do you have on your farm at a single time? About 100,000. 100,000? How do you ensure that your standards are applied to every duck given your production volume? I provided your office with the statistics that are comparing uh, as an indicator of uh, animal welfare the comparative mortality rates for various poultry rearing facilities. And uh, if you reviewed that, you saw that while our ducks are uh, raised for 105 days, our farm mortality rate is 4.5%. Chickens, uh, our certified humane antibiotic free chickens, uh, at 42 days have a mortality rate of about 4.7% certified organic chickens at 42 days. Um, so we keep statistics at about 7%. Regular ducks that are not grown for foie gras uh, at 42 days are at about 5%. So those uh, welfare indicators are very carefully tracked at every point in, in the process. We have caretakers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we have 12 in in the uh, pre gavage period, in the nurseries, in the growing. So I wanted to ask, I did, I did get the data, and I thank you, because we have had a conversation, 
and I thought it was very reasonable and, and it was very, quite pleasant. And I, the data that you sent to me, from what I remember, wasn't very comprehensive. It didn't account for injuries. It was only for one week. So if you have longer, more comprehensive data, I'm happy to, to take that and review it. Absolutely send anything my way. I just have another question. So there's 100,000 ducks on the farm, and there's how many workers? I think you said 285? About 280, yes. 280, 285. What, what policies are in place? This is the question I was trying to get at earlier. What policies are in place to ensure that 285 workers could feed 100,000 ducks and still reach those quality standards that you are discussing today? Uh, we have uh, farm worker codes of conduct for each of the different sections of the farm. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the gavage section is, I think, the, the, the one that, that we're most concerned about. And so we have a, uh, uh, we have a bonus system or a profit sharing system uh, where the, the different measures of animal welfare, the quality of the output, the mortality rate uh, is, is rewarded so that each person uh, is assigned a certain number of ducks. And each duck, one by one, is evaluated during the processing stage. And then the, uh, uh, and then the workers, by the quality of their output, which is, reflects the quality of the animal care are given. I saw the bonus numbers for the last uh, uh, last week. It's a three-week cycle for feeding the ducks. Uh, I think the average was close to $400 for each worker last week. So we're doing a really great job right now. So you have workers responsible each for hun hundreds of ducks. So I just want to you know, be very just honest about, again, the data that you sent, I did not find it comprehensive and it did not account for injuries from what I recall. So I understand you've had a number of people here with you and there will always be a difference in opinion. I think what we're trying to get at today is how we ethically define the humane treatment of animals. So I wanna thank you for, for your testimony and for everyone else's and with that, Chair, I thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rivera. Um, and thank you to this panel. We're going to move on to the next panel, which will be uh, Eve Buell from the Woodstock Farm Sanctuary, Holly Cheever from New York State Humane Association, Jean Bauer from the Farm Sanctuary, Ashley Byrne from PETA, Blair Marshall, Viola Agostini, Nicole Fernandez, uh, and Dahlia Benaroya. Yes. I need to refer to it, so can I give it to you afterwards? So I just need to be able to refer to it, so can I give it to you afterwards? I, I have some and we are going to try and keep it moving because we're under very severe time constraints. So. Uh, I'll allow you to please uh, kick us off if you can pull a microphone. Are you speaking as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Do you want to start? If I could have quiet, please. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Byrne, and I'm an associate director with PETA and a longtime resident of New York City. And I'm speaking on behalf of our several thousand members and supporters here uh, who live in the New York City area. Um, PETA absolutely supports the bill to ban foie gras sales from the city. Um, investigations at every foie gras farm in the United States and throughout Europe have all documented sick, dead, and dying animals, some with holes in their necks from pipe injuries. You know, there's been a lot of talk from uh, people here in support of foie gras saying to come visit the farms. Well. We have had people visit the farms, and I'd like to talk about what they saw. A PETA investigation at Hudson Valley Foie Gras, which is a factory farm, previously uh, called Commonwealth Enterprises, found that a single worker was expected to force feed 500 birds three times each day. The pace meant that they often treated the birds roughly and left them injured and suffering. 
So many ducks died from ruptured organs resulting from overfeeding that workers who killed fewer than 50 birds per month were given a bonus. By Hudson Valley's own calculations, approximately 15,000 ducks on the farm die every year before they can be slaughtered. Ducks who don't die prematurely at Hudson Valley are killed on site, and PETA's investigator documented one bird during their visit who was still moving after his throat had been cut. The birds suffered from other ailments as well, including one duck who had a maggot-ridden neck wound so severe that water spilled out of it when he drank. At a farm near Montreal that is owned by uh, Palmex Inc., which is a brand of uh, Rouget, who is uh, represented here today as well, Rouget, PETA documented ducks lined up in rows of iron coffin-like cages that encased their bodies like vices. The birds' heads and necks protruded through small openings to make the force feeding easier for the human workers, and the birds couldn't uh, turn around or spread a single wing. And I'll just say that similar conditions have been documented on the largest French foie gras factory farms. Um, so this is, cruelty is just standard in this industry. There is no such thing as humane foie gras. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, sir. Good afternoon, Good afternoon council members. Good afternoon, Chair Levine. My name is Hervé Bra. I am the um, shelter director at uh, Woodstock Farm Sanctuary, uh, where we care for 370 rescued animals, amongst them 40 ducks. Um, and I'm here today to testify in strong support of uh, the, the intro 1378. I'm um, originally from France, and I worked as a campaign manager for the Animal Rights Association L214 for three years, and I conducted um, investigations in uh, over a dozen foie gras farm. So I've seen firsthand what's happening in there. And we were invited, um, we were invited, and, we, and what we saw when we were invited was quite different than when we were not invited. And um, we've talked about the cruelty that's happening with the, the force feeding, the two pounds of uh, corn mash that are thrown down their throat in five seconds uh, with the help of, of uh, pneumatic pump, we've talked about the holes in their throats and about um, them gasping for hair because of the size of the liver pushing on, on their lungs. But there are things we have not talked about. Uh, for instance, they are debeaked and that we don't talk about, otherwise they fight with each other. Also, we did not say that the females are killed because their livers have too many veins and do not produce foie gras. So maybe that's something that should be talked about. Um, I'm talking about... All right. The first thing you notice when you go in those farms is the silence. Uh, the, um, the mullers are sterile, but they are also mute. So it's very, you only hear the fans. And you, you, you also smell, there's a rancid smell in those farms coming from the, the, uh, the corn mash. Um, and you see that those, those ducks dying, the, the corn mash coming out of their, of their mouths. That's very common to see those. I've seen so many of those, those ducks dying um, while we, we were visiting those farms. So it's a French tradition, but it's, it, it's changing very quickly. And I will, I will, uh, I will wrap up uh, by saying that there was um, a survey that was done in November 2017 in France, and 58% of French people were in favor of banning the force feeding of ducks and geese. And 37% of French people refused to buy foie gras for ethical reasons. And so that's very recent. And also I want to say that 23 um, out of the 28 European Union countries have banned the production of foie gras because of its cruelty. So France now has become an exception. And, uh, um, and I hope that New York will follow the, step, uh, the steps of those uh, uh, European countries and also will also listen French people that in the vast majority are opposed to foie gras, uh, even though it's cultural and, um, and since the, the, the footage have come out, not only thanks to L214, people really Thank see what's happening. Thank you very much. Please. <clears throat> Is this on? Yes. Um, I'm Dr. Holly Cheever, and I've been to Hudson Valley Foie Gras on three occasions. First in 1991, as part of an undercover investigation from PETA. Secondly, uh, in 1997, as uh, at the request of Whole Foods, who were sought by Hudson Valley Foie Gras to come to the plant to see how humane their product was as an uh, offering to 
as a food chores choice, and um, of course they hoped that Whole Foods would pick them up and, and uh, distribute them nationwide. And what's important about that particular visit in 1997 was that that was the last time the public ever got a chance to see foie gras as it is done at Hudson Valley foie gras um, nowadays as well. The third time I went as a guest invited by Dr. Larry Bartoff, whom you heard speak in the previous panel, uh, and then is where we began to see these very sanitized, choreographed, and altered forms of public display once Hudson Valley foie gras realized that the public could not see the real activity because Whole Foods wrote a stinging rebuke to them saying that they were lied to, that clearly this was a torturous process, and that they would never carry any kind of foie gras Hudson Valley products ever in their uh, dis national distribution of food types. Um, so in all the animals um, that I have seen, both living and dead, I've seen pneumonia, I've seen gross liver failure, I've seen liver rupture, I've seen esophageal trauma and esophageal rupture, and I've also seen hepatic encephalopathy, which is Greek for if my liver dies, then my brain is going to die as well. And I've also seen on two occasions workers actually forcing the feeding tubes down the necks of seizuring birds because, again, if the liver is in failure, it cannot process the blood to keep toxins away from the brain, and the brain then goes into its own form of, of uh, illness. One thing we haven't mentioned about these birds is they are not a natural species. They are a hybrid species, usually a hybrid cross of Pekin and Muscovy ducks, neither of whom have any migrating DNA in them. So to say that this is going to be mimicking natural migratory behavior is nonsense. And um, the reason they are chosen is that they live longer than other species do as a hybrid, and therefore they can make it past the four weeks, which is typically when the death rate begins to become so uh, overwhelming that it eats up the profits. And this was stated by uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, who is the owner of Sonoma Valley Foie Gras in California at the time when that uh, business was shut down by California passing a law. I know I'm at the end of my um, speaking time, but if anyone from the council would like to know the difference between the um, sanitized versions, the choreographed tours that started happening after California's passage of the law uh, on the East Coast, Hudson Valley Foie Gras saw that the writing was on the wall and gourmet magazine chefs, editors, cooks, veterinarians were all coming to see, we want to visit. And so if anyone has any curiosity about that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Chris DeRose, president of and founder of Last Chance for Animals. We're based out of Los Angeles. I'm from Brooklyn originally, but uh, I came out here for this from uh, Los Angeles. Um, I love New York. I love what it could be, I love what it is, and, um, but I, I'm not gonna go, I, had, I wrote a great, great talk, but I'm not gonna do it, so I'm gonna spare you that because my colleagues have said it better than I'd be, I'd be able to say it. Um, you know, New York has proudly withstood the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. We have uh, cleaned up the city from crime and uh, gangs, made the streets safe again here. But I'm here to have one, I have one question that I have to answer. Um, why can't we also know, know to have this city be known as the most compassionate city in the world? Why do we have to uh, let the ugliness of small uh, profit-driven uh, businesses like the foie gras and the horse, -drawn, uh, horse carriages, why do we have to let them uh, terminate with the, the ugliness of New York City and tarnish the name of New York City. The strength of a nation is judged by the way the, the, uh, uh, its uh, animals are treated, but I think that's also has to do with the city of New York. We're, we're a big city. We could set the pace for the rest of the world. We could, um, we can be here, we could be the first major city in the world to become a caring, compassionate city not only for its human population, but also for all its living beings. If you were to do to a human being what they do to these ducks and geese, you would be considered the sickest and the sadest of human beings. And, but because it's an animal, we 
we, we were able to justify it as food or they're just animals and they don't care and they don't feel. They do feel. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I put a ban on the uh, foie gras, obviously. So, and also for the carriage horses. Thank you. Thank you. I never would have guessed you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, Great. Please, Thank sir. you so much to the council and to the kind-hearted people of New York who have come out today to speak for compassion for animals. Um, how we treat other animals says a lot about who we are and what is acceptable. And on farms across the U.S., bad has become normal. And there's been talk about factory farming, and that's important. Um, I, I co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 86 and have been visiting factory farms since that time. Um, we care for animals who've been rescued from these abuses, including ducks who've come from foie gras farms, and they are some of the most sick animals we've ever had. Um, the one thing that is so important to remember is that these animals would die if they were not slaughtered at a young age. Their livers are 10 times the normal size. That is really the take home message. And the folks in the foie gras industry who are de defending this are not necessarily bad people. They've come to accept things and normalize them and use actually the word factory farming as a bad thing, which is good, but what is humane? And they also use the word humane. And in fact, if you look at page six of the uh, document that was provided, it talks about how Hudson Valley foie gras tried to use the word humane and was disallowed because it was not a humane product. And they talk about how it's not a factory farm, but if you look at page five of this uh, brochure, or this uh, hound out, that's a factory farm. Having 100,000 animals is a factory farm. So what is okay becomes the question. And this is a product that we do not need. This is a product that is the result of torture. Um, and it is outside the bounds of acceptable conduct in our society. And our societal views are shifting. And this is one of those things that at a certain point we'll look back on and say, how could we have done that? So thank you. Thank you very much. Were there additional speakers on this panel that we need to swap? Oh, forgive me. Yes. Uh, real quick. My name is Blair Marshall, and I live in Flushing, New York. I'm Peter Coos' constituent. I respectfully ask that intro 1378 be passed by your committee. As someone who was born and raised in New York, I'm worried and concerned that foie gras is legally served in New York City restaurants. Foie gras is an extravagant dish that is the result of cruel force feeding of ducks. And I've heard a lot about, um, you know, and I sympathize with the person on the other side who, who shared his hardship about coming in and being an immigrant. Um, I grew up on Fifth Avenue. I'm a debutante. I had a privileged life until I had some mental health problems, and my family was nowhere to be found. If it weren't for the laws in this city, I would have been homeless. And I want to give voice to the animals who do not have a voice. And these birds are being tortured. And 81% um, of New York City voters support a sales ban on force fed foie gras. I stand with them. I ask that the committee pass this bill as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And are there others who need to swap in here? Okay, if I could ask just two of you to uh, rotate your seats, please. Thank you. Oh, three, forgive me. Yep. Hello, I'm Dahlia Benaroy. I live in District 19 in Queens. Um, as an animal lover and a president of a website design company, I created a website platform to share information about the abuses of animals for the public because many people are not aware of what goes on in the animal, animal welfare area. Um, being in the computer field, I also want to make an, a note that Millions of people will lose their jobs due to artificial intelligence, and society is not stopping this progress due to that, so why should they stop for the animals? Um, a lot of abuse was mentioned about the ducks that go through these processes. These are male ducks. Nobody mentioned the fact that um, female ducklings are not useful so what do they do? Multiple millions of 
female ducks are just tossed into grinders while alive. In France, 40 million are, are killed that way. So um, they're also, um, that's also animal abuse. Over three, million, three billion animals are killed daily for food. Before they're killed, most if not all are abused and tortured. I don't expect the world to save three billion animals, but if we wanna be humane, we, we need to chip away where we can. And this is one place where we can do that with intro 13, 1378. I really thank all of you for being so pro-animal welfare. I'm really thrilled, thank you. Thank you, please. Hello, my name is Viola Agostini. I reside in District 36. My councilman is uh, uh, Robert Cornegie. I'm here to support the intro 1378, the ban of sale of foie gras. New York City became my home uh, almost 10 years ago. I moved, from here, I moved here from Italy to pursue my dreams in the hospitality business and learn more about different cuisines from around the world. Italian food is good, but I knew there was more to explore in the gastronomy world, especially in a city like New York. I quickly became a big fan of French restaurants, and therefore I discovered foie gras, which honestly I loved. I remember telling my American friends what foie gras was. At the time, I knew it was just duck liver, and they used to look at me with a face of disgust, while I always had a better feedback from my European friends in regard of it. Until one day on social media, I came across an article on how foie gras is made. Foie gras literally means fatty liver, which technically is a diseased liver and is obtained by force feeding ducks and geese with a metal or plastic pole jammed down their throat in order to feed them up to four pounds for food per day. The investigation found that a single worker was expected to force, fed, force feed 500 birds three times each day, therefore causing lots of suffering and injuries to the birds. Can you just try to be in their feather for just one minute? Well, I did, and I couldn't stand the thought of being involved as a, as a consumer in such a cruel and abusive industry. My taste was no more important than a living being life. I also would like to add that as a former tourist and someone that brings lots of visitors in New York City, the one thing they all agree as the most ugly attraction that I've seen are the horse carriages in Central Park, especially during the hot summer days, painting and suffering for a job they never asked to do. So I fully support the intro 1425, they are, uh, the carriage horse eat relief bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, members of the Committee on Health. Um, my name is Nicole Fernandez and I reside in District 36. My council member is Robert Cornegy. Uh, and before I begin what I prepared, uh, I would just like to comment on regard to what was said regarding AVMA. The AVMA is actually on record supporting the ban on foie gras and they condemn the artificial force feeding of ducks and geese to produce foie gras. Okay, uh, so and um, today I'm here to express my support for intro 1378, uh, which would put an end to the sale of foie gras in New York City. Uh, for six years, I worked in a gastroenterology office where we performed endoscopies on a weekly basis. And if you are unfamiliar, endoscopies are a medical procedure that involve having a long, flexible tube inserted down the esophagus of the patient for the purpose of diagnosing various medical issues. I can distinctly recall the apprehension that patients would experience the day of their test. I would put them at ease by holding their hands as they would receive anesthesia. I can also remember my trepidation once I had to undergo this procedure myself. Uh, this procedure is far less severe than what many ducks and geese endure for foie gras. The tube that is forced down their throats is a rigid metal or plastic tube. These ducks and geese are not afforded the same comfort and care that I was given. There's no anesthesia and they are stuffed to 10 times their natural size. Can you imagine having to experience this yourself? My cats at home will squirm in discomfort when I need to hold them still just to administer oral medications. Animals feel fear and they suffer. To think that these animals, the same animals that can be seen peacefully sailing through the waters in Central Park would have this forced upon them, all for one high-priced delicacy item on a menu is quite appalling, especially when 81% of New Yorkers are against foie gras. New York City needs to join California and over a dozen European countries that have already banned the despicable practice. 
Lastly, I would like to add my support for intro 1425, the carriage horse heat relief bill. This bill will greatly reduce the heat exhaustion that horses suffer year after year in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to this panel. Okay. Okay, due, due to the fact that we need this room to be set up for the stated meeting, we're gonna to transition to the committee room. It's gonna be a little tight. Bear with us, we will continue.